If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Holy moly! Listen, in this episode of Mind Pump, we met with a very intelligent and large yeah. human being. It's a whole lot of intelligent meat. Ben Pakulski, probably... Now, I'm, I am I follow bodybuilding a little bit. I did quite a bit as a kid, and even now I'm still kind of uh, you know in the world in terms of like watching it, whatever. I know Adam is very in the world. You're a big fanboy, let's be honest. Ben Pakulski is one of the most respected bodybuilders. Well, he... Yeah. Uh, and I think I talk about this in the episode with him, was when I was getting into competing... And I really didn't know what the fuck I was doing. Like I've, I've been a trainer and I've been training for a very long time. So I understand nutrition. I understand lifting weights very, very well. But I've never got on stage and competed. So right away, I started looking into like all the pros that were out there, both in men's physique and bodybuilding. And I had a really hard time finding guys that were putting out good information. So one of the things, being someone who's been a trainer for as long as I have, I, right away I could tell when it was like bro science or bullshit. Like mm-hmm. I'd find some pro that was, I'm like, God, this guy's an idiot. Like this mm-hmm. guy, like all these guys are like, are you kidding me? Like there's got to be somebody out there. And this is actually how I found Ben was I was like, oh, wow, finally a dude, he has his kines degree. Mm-hmm. And you could tell when he presents himself and when he talks about mechanics and when he talks about nutrition, like he doesn't bullshit. He has a sound approach to this. Very yeah. sound approach. Very, very sound approach and very intelligent. And instantly I was drawn to his message. And even though he hasn't won Mr. Olympia yet, in my opinion, uh, he is one of, if not the smartest guy that hits the Olympia stage. He's uh, and he's impressive what, as hell. What really impressed me a lot about him is he also has a uh, a good understanding and openness to what total wellness is. He's not just mm-hmm. he hasn't pigeonholed himself in terms of just being a bodybuilder. Of course, he understands bodybuilding very very well, uh, and he takes a very scientific approach. But he's also open to other avenues of health and wellness and experiments with them and learns from other people in those realms, he is, uh, you know, he's one of these, like a renaissance man. He's one of those mm-hmm. people that's kind of in all these things and wants to learn. That was the most surprising for sure, to, to meet somebody of that stature and that sort of, uh, like being ingrained and well-known in the bodybuilding community and having that kind of an open mind and thought process where, oh, wow, let me look into, you know, uh, uh, you know the microbiome and, you know, all these other wellness, uh, you know, pursuits. So that was refreshing to see. And he, and he drops, uh, he I believe, I don't think he has yet uh, released the information that he releases on this show. No, so he a actually, major announcement. <laughs> he makes a That's major right. a major announcement in this episode. So this will be the first time uh, he says what he says on this episode publicly. So if you're a fan, you're going to want to listen to us and you're going to want to share this. Um, but again, tons of respect for the guy. We were invited down to his uh, MI40 gym in Tampa. We had a great workout there. One of the best uh, bodybuilder gyms I've ever been to. Um, he took us through some exercises. We all got to do some photos together, which was really cool. Uh, you can find his uh, website is benpakulski.com. Pakulski spelt P-A-K-U-L-S-K-I. His YouTube channel is Ben Pack IFBB. And he also has a podcast, uh, Muscle Expert Podcast. And his Instagram is IFBB uh, Ben Pack. Make sure if you guys really enjoy this episode, aside from just sharing it, go over to Muscle Expert Podcast. Check out what he's dropping. He's got some good guests over there. And, and leave him a five star review for sure if you guys enjoy this. And uh, don't forget, we got three days left. It's the final three days oh, for our massive. Buy one, get ba, one ba, 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 promotion uh, where if you enroll in our uh, super bundle, which includes all of our MAPS programs, it's a year's worth of exercise programs. So basically, you pay this fee, you get all these programs, everything's worked out for you for an entire year, and it progresses you through different kinds of programs, different types of adaptations, everything from you know, maximal strength training to mobility work to training like a stage competitor or a bodybuilder, uh, learning how to prime your body, correct imbalances, how to train without equipment so you can get that proprioception that you get from body weight exercises. It's all there and it's all phased uh, and put together planned out for you. So it's like a year's, like again, it's a year's worth of exercise programming and it's discounted uh, anyways. But on top of that, you enroll in the MAP Super Bundle. You'll get one for free for anyone you want. So friend, mm. 
family member, your workout partner, your your wife, your husband, whoever you want. It's the last three days. It's not a full month promotion. We're ending it short because, again, it's a big promo. So to enroll in this program, go to mindpumpmedia.com. And without any further ado, here we are talking to Ben Pakulski. Ben, let me hear your voice. Talk. Check, check. Check, check. He's a little quiet. Give me, give me a little more Ben. A little more Ben in my life. A little more Ben. Everybody you, needs more Ben in yeah, life. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Now he's, I might start singing. You're in trouble. Yeah, oh, Do shit. it. I'll Dude, back you up. I'll back you up. Bro. I really hate you if you could sing too, bro. No, okay, oh, God, come I was like, on. Dude, Ability oh, stronger than <laughs> fuck you, I dude. I do not. Shit. You got a nice beard. <laughs> yeah, you got, you got big old muscles. Uh, I mean, oh, all you need is an epic ballad. Be- besides the fact that I was lifting more weight than you, everything else is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bust out in some Pavarotti in a minute. You guys don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I think my head would explode. <laughs> Dude, I tell you what, this is uh, probably top three for me, gyms I've uh, ever been in, man. Yeah. I think you uh, designed this pretty well, buddy. I think for, for bodybuilding, it's got to be, uh, it's perfect, uh, especially if you're in hypertrophy style type training. Hold on a minute here, Adam. What the fuck do you mean top three, man? I know. I just, <laughs> he's like, it's one, bro. <laughs> well, I'm just well, kidding, man. No, no, you're right. I, mean, I, I was trying to think. I know. I said, I was telling the guys, I was like, we've been in so many goddamn gyms. Well, Shapati's gym is great. Now, it's that's, different, though. But that's, no, it's different, though. Shapati doesn't even crack top three for really me. Mm. it's cool i like it yeah, yeah, but that's, your, that's your style but yeah. I, I like it don't get me wrong like there's but i gotta have all this i get inspired by this i gotta have yeah. this i gotta have yeah. the stuff the atmosphere sure. is everything right is the atmosphere here like to you like now obviously the equipment is world class and we did we can anybody can do that though so did we do a good job with the atmosphere with absolutely the, definitely 100 no that's absolutely good. and even the way you even the way you separated and we were talking on the floor earlier the way you laid out the squat rack and deadlift uh areas just it's the way you separate it from all the machines and everything, and the dumbbells. I think that's perfect, like that, man. Well, I'm a very mindful human being. You know, everything I do, I try to be mindful, and it, it doesn't stop in the gym, right? It's like everything needs to be where it needs to be for a reason. And Casim, my uh, uh, head of education here, and I kind of sit down, and Joe, uh, you guys met, sat down and just pondered, like, hey, where should this be? How should this be set up? And and it all needs to be in the right place as it needs to feel right you know you yeah. you talk we you know our, our so our audience knows we had a, the pleasure of having dinner at an amazing place with you last night and you talk a lot about mindfulness self-awareness did you have that as a child growing up like where, where, where did you evolve into someone like Good that? question man <laughs> you're gonna dig there already huh right yeah. away, right fucking, oh, we're already we're already <laughs> boys now bro we had dinner together we worked out together i go Shit. right to the I've heart right been away calling your names for the last oh, couple yeah. hours <laughs> open up man yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about yeah. your parents um, <laughs> so <laughs> so was I mindful as a kid I mean, I'll tell you the honest truth uh, I became very mindful at a young age so um, pretty much everyone in my family uh, not to throw anybody under the bus is overweight and most of the people are alcoholics so um, I became very mindful of the idea that that family over there across the road whomever they happen to be had the ability to drive what they want have a really nice house be happy smile take cool vacations and we didn't and I was like, well, what separates them from me? Like, what makes them different from me? Are they better? Are they different? And, and what allows them to do the things they want to do, have the things they want to have? And I'm maybe not there. And, and you know, why is my family maybe not happy? Um, and these other people seem so, at least externally happy, you know, perception wise. Um, what's the difference? And I just became aware of asking that question for me. And that was the step. That was step one, right? Is like. Um, awareness, I think, is massive, and uh, I, I remember being aware from as early as maybe seven or eight years old. Is like looking at my family and, and almost being, uh, you know, not to be a dick, but almost being repulsed by the the reality of like obesity and um, negativity and um, uh, lack of self um, awareness, lack of. Um, now, was there attitude like uh, in that victim kind of mentality where it's like, it's my genes, it's my, or did they feel empowered to change those things? I think they just accepted their reality, man. Nobody mm-hmm. has ever changed their reality. Um, they just said, hey, this is what we have. I, I don't even think they had the awareness to, to realize that more was possible. Mm-hmm. I think that's all. It, and a lot of people get stuck in that, right? And luckily for me, I wasn't. I mean, I mean, I was lucky enough to reach out and realize like, hey, I can do more than accept this shitty existence um you know just the fact that i was exposed to some cool things some cool people i saw like man like fuck that guy's driving a nice car what's different from him and my family hmm. you know, hey that guy's got abs what the fuck are he's he got a hot chick what's what's mm-hmm. what's that and what's the what what sets him apart and i just asked those questions from a from a young age well from a uh speaking i mean meeting you you're obviously you're a pro bodybuilder um Probably yes. one of the most self-aware, um, and I'm talking from a fitness standpoint, uh, bodybuilders that I've ever met. 
in the sense that you know, first we come into your gym and when you go to a bodybuilding gym, you expect to see machines, you expect to see some dumbbells and barbells, but I was surprised to see chains in the back and some powerlifting stuff, sleds. And then when we were talking last night, you were talking about doing yoga four days a week and mobility work. And even Adam was messing with you a little bit during our workout, asking you to do a pistol squat and, you know, squats on the sides of your feet. And shockingly enough, I mean, here's a, you know, you're what, how much do you weigh right now? About 260, 270? 280. 280. Shit. I mean, you're a big dude. And he's doing these mobil- mobility movements. And it's impressive to see because typically at that level of competing, People become so myopic with their view. It's so you know, uh, so it, narrow. It has to be, man. And I was I was just as guilty as everybody else. Is literally as we spoke about briefly in the workout. I blocked out the whole world. And if you happen to be someone who was unlucky enough to get in my tunnel vision, I'd fucking run you over. Mm-hmm. And that was the way I became successful. And a lot of my um, the people that I've encountered along the way will attest to that, man. I wasn't a mean person. I was a never a mean person. But if I was in the gym or if I was focused on something, get the fuck out of my way. Sorry, can I swear? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, fuck, you're yeah. My, you're my <laughs> fuck, yeah. <laughs> this is a Howard yeah, Stern of yeah, fitness, yeah. bro. You can say whatever you want to um, say. Yeah. So I, I was very, very focused, man. And I get very uh, offended if you were so audacious to get in my way. Mm. Um, yeah, I, had, I was very singular focused. And when I was outside the gym, it may have been different. But inside the gym, it was very singular focused. And, uh, and, and I realized that was maybe one of my biggest attributes during my career and one of my biggest detriments toward the end of my career man is i hated the idea that like i started to lose mobility i couldn't run anymore like i could but it just didn't feel right man or i'd I'd Mm. bend over to pick shit up do you know the biggest realization for me was i'd be at home and there'd be something on the floor and i'm i I intentionally wouldn't bend over to pick it up Mm. (laughs) and like i'm like what the fuck's the matter like i'm not i didn't wasn't raised this way like i like if i have something on the floor i bend my ass over and i pick it up and I'd be like, man, just don't bend it over, pick it up anymore. Maybe it hurt. Like maybe unconsciously, like my back would hurt or my hip would hurt or something. And I'd be like, I'm not going to pick that up. And that was like the first awareness. I was like, all right, this is something's wrong here, man. You got to fix this. And that's where I started getting back into yoga and mobility. I've always been a very mobile person. Hmm. Um, you know, I was a guy at 18 years old who put my ankle behind my behind my head. Oh, wow. Um, but I lost that because I was so singular focused on needing to be as big as possible and to get as big, as big as humanly possible, which is bodybuilding, right? Now, do you see a place in that type of training, mobility, yoga, flexibility in someone's arsenal who is, you know, you got a guy, right? I'm sure you get lots of these messages from, from young dudes who are like, listen, I just want to build muscle. I just want to look muscular. Do you see there being a place in their training for these types of things that not only will not take away from building muscle, that, but may actually contribute to it? And range of motion, active range of motion is everything in bodybuilding. And, and so many bodybuilders you see become, you know, using the term muscle bound. What does that mean? It just means their bodies become really, really good in this really small range of motion. And if they go outside of there, they're weak as kittens and oftentimes they get hurt. Mm-hmm. And to eliminate that muscle bound, um, you know, restriction, it's absolutely necessary that you're getting strong at these ranges that you've never gone in before. And for most people that requires like bunny first soft contractions to start. Like it's literally not even body weight, right? It's less than body weight. Mm -hmm. Um, And then progressing toward now I can actually load this substantially enough to actually hypertrophy a muscle. So it starts with stability, right? You got to create stability in in, in every aspect of every range of motion that you have access to. um, And then getting stronger from there. And that, you know, creates the... Um, the impenetrable physique, right? That creates the physique that's almost, you, you know, you get an S on your chest kind of thing, mm-hmm. right? I can't, you can't get hurt. Nothing gets hurt because I'm so strong everywhere I go. Even besides that, like one of the pillars of hypertrophy training, when, th- something that was mind-blowing for me years ago in my training was, you know, one of the pillars of, of hypertrophy training is to train a muscle in full ranges of motion. Sure. And that full range of motion changes as you challenge that range of motion, as you gain more strength in those new ranges of motion. So training for what you're talking about is not just going to help you with mobility and stability. You're also going to build more muscle because sure. now you can connect. You know, if I'm doing a fly and I'm coming down to 90 degrees, and if I start to work in that deeper range of motion, start to connect in those deeper ranges of motion, I may have to go lighter, but I'm training in, in, in ranges of motion I've never trained before. It's a new stimulus, and I'm going to grow more muscle. And this is a message we try to communicate sometimes to people. It's like, look, it's not going to take away from your ability to build muscle. It's going to contribute to your ability to build muscle. It's going to sure. add aesthetics. So here's an important realization. You say, you know, you have to go lighter in certain ranges, and that's an absolute reality. But the realization is just because I go lighter at certain parts of the range doesn't mean, necessarily mean I need to not go heavy in the mid-range. So I'm strong in the mid-range. 
fucking go strong go heavy there but if you're really weak somewhere else it's okay to go weak there just realizing that your body has a different uh capacity or different ability to generate work or generate force in these different parts of the range Mm -hmm. and that's okay but you still have to appropriately stimulate muscle everywhere Mm. it's not like oh just because i'm i'm using you know girly weights or pink dumbbells in these particular ranges doesn't mean i'm not using really really heavy weights where i'm strong because you still want to challenge the muscle as much as you could possibly challenge it, as much as it can handle without being hurt. So yeah, here's you're, what you're big on that uh, challenging that uh, that that strength, strength curve, curve, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've yes. noticed that in your gym, like a lot of the machines are based off of that. Can you explain that a little bit? About, sure, man. Yeah. It, it's the simple reality that a muscle has a varying ability to, to generate force at all parts of its contractile range. So when a muscle is fully lengthened, it has one ability, and the mid range has a different ability, and the short range has a different ability. So uh, wouldn't it just make sense that I would want to appropriately challenge that muscle? to what it's capable of at all the parts of that range. And the perfect, you know, if you could design the perfect set or the perfect rep, it would um, challenge my muscle 100% max effort through every part of the range, but nobody's designed an, an exercise equipment like that. It would be mm. kind of an isokinetic thing. Uh, it doesn't exist. So what we do here is we have a, a company called Prime that we have a lot of their equipment and it allows us to, um, uh, as close as is possible, match what the body's capable of at all parts of the range. So there's parts where you're strong, man, and load it heavy, yep. and there's parts where you're weak. So take a little bit off and that's okay it, you know that, that's the most efficient way to challenge a muscle so i'm i'm you know pretty vocal on the show about net not necessarily being a fan of machines for the most part but what's interesting is when you're talking about what you're saying it's absolutely true in where you know you're going to be doing a movement and you're much stronger at one part of the range of motion than you are in another part of the range of motion mm-hmm. and free weights have their own just because of gravity, they're going to be heavier at some parts and lighter sure. at other parts, and you can't necessarily challenge those other parts right. unless you change angles and whatnot. But how do you do that within the movement? What I find that what I found that was interesting with your plate loaded equipment that was out there was that there were different. You could load the plates in different parts of the machine, so that you could overload different parts of the rep. Exactly. And I remember, I can't. I think it might have been Nautilus that did this a long time ago with their with their selectorized equipment or at least they made an attempt to do something like this where you could kind of change the attachment of the cam or whatever Strive. was that okay was that what it was so um but yeah th- with the plate loaded equipment you're able to do that right. um and i can see some some real benefit in, sure. in doing that for people who you know even old people or people who have weaknesses or injuries like going to those places where you're really weak so most people have this um preconceived notion that if i'm weak somewhere i should avoid it and that doesn't make any sense at all Mm -hmm. right like if you're weak somewhere you need to go there you just need to go there with what's appropriate for what you can handle right now and then challenge it progressively so doesn't it make perfect sense for anyone who has an injury or anyone who's trying to optimize performance like you got to go through these ranges but you got to load it to appropriately to what what it's capable of doing and that's what these machines allow us to do which is what you need a opportunity now that being said what do you think about because I feel like there's this trend happening right now of kids attaching rubber bands to <laughs> all these machines. <laughs> Mindlessly just slapping it on there because it yeah. looks cool. Yeah, have you seen Are that? Are they doing it sure, right? of course they can. Yeah. No, well, so, <laughs> it, yeah, it's mindless. I mean, it, is there a benefit? Um, so bands have a tremendous benefit when used properly uh, in specific exercises and specific scenarios. One of the things that it does, though, um, that may be a side benefit to these guys who really have no idea where to load, like we see guys loading on equipment and you're like, man, that's just backwards. (laughs) But what the benefit is, it changes the inertial properties of uh, uh, free weight. Uh, It changes the inertial properties of a machine, which means uh, it forces you to either have to slow down deceleration. So if I'm doing a negative and eccentric with a band, it's going to fucking sling back at me if I don't slow it down. Right. So, New adaptation, right? right? Yeah. yeah, so it's going to force me to dampen the inertial properties, which there's benefits on. Um, and it may even be accelerating me in one direction. So I, again, you know, there's, so there's different benefits. So either I'm pushing against a band, so it changes the resistance, or I'm decelerating a band, which again is going to change the resistance, all of which just makes people more mindful and more in control. And mm-hmm. if people can do that alone, they will make tremendous progress in their training. And that's what everybody lacks, right? Everybody goes to the gym, they're too busy like thinking about their Instagram post or whoever just wrote a negative comment on their, their or who didn't like their page or something. And they're not being mindful of anything they do. And if we can at least shift the, the paradigm of, of people in the gym to being a little bit mindful and putting a little bit of a thought process in there, we, we've probably moved the needle a lot. Well, now, how do you do that mm. with, and this is the challenge I always have, which is teaching people that there's a place for almost everything mm-hmm. and like how to focus on the big rocks. Like, how do you speak to that to like a, a young kid? I'm 17 years old. I see you doing like these really unique, cool movements, but yet maybe I don't even squat or deadlift or bitch. Like, how do you speak to a, a young mind like that that is 
just maybe seeing something on Instagram and trying it because they think their their idol does it. Sure. So how do you talk to someone? Yeah, man. So, I mean, I guess it depends where you are in your journey and everybody's a different point in their journey, but we, we kind of developed the process, right? Is I think everything needs to start with execution. You need to master your execution first because um, just from a muscle recruitment perspective, you're trying to prioritize the muscle you're trying to prioritize. If you're trying to work your chest, at least let's start by making sure your chest is doing work. If you're, if you're trying to prioritize your shoulders, well, the first and most important thing is make sure your shoulders is actually working when you're trying to work your shoulders. Like, so execution from my perspective is number one, uh, and then learning how to load that muscle and maintain tension. And then mm. from there you start looking into, uh, what is your limiting factor? So Justin and I had this conversation, um, in the gym when we were training is I've always approached it from a perspective of, well, what sucks? Like what is holding me back? What's my limiting factor? Whether it be something as simple as my cardiovascular conditioning, whether it be my mobility, whether it be my stability of certain joint, whether it be my range of motion somewhere, my, my ability to clear lactic acid. Do I get a tremendous amount of lactic acid? Do I get it? Do I have really bad focus? Uh, what is it? And just look at it and like, and, and objectively assess, well, this really sucks. So make that a strength, like do everything in your power in the next short amount of time, whether it be four to six weeks or three months, however long it takes, Make that your number one priority to, to be awesome at it, right? So most people don't just, you know, they'll see it and like, oh, forget about it. it is, you know, or I'll change my type of training to not stress that system where it should be the opposite training, right? It should be like, hey, man, I really suck at this. Yeah. I need to do more of it. Something you said last night that was – Gross-minded. Uh, that was awesome um, because uh, having been – I was a huge fan of bodybuilding. It's what got me into exercise um, when I was a kid. And uh, one of the things that uh, – bodybuilding has been espousing now for a little while and i don't know when this transition happened was if you're not growing you're not building muscle if you're not burning body fat it's all diet or supplements or drugs uh what and, and nobody ever talks about exercise programming mm -hmm. and something you said last night which i don't ever really expect to hear from a bodybuilder or a pro bodybuilder is you said no it's their programming like nobody puts any effort or thought into their exercise programming. The workouts all look the same. Mm -hmm. When did that transition happen? Why, why did bodybuilders stop really paying attention to their exercise programming as one of the main reasons why their body may not be responding? Because the changing? gear got so good that they could get away with bad programming. Sure. Well, yes and no, man. That, I think that this is actually the opposite. So that's kind of the conversation we had last night. Is all these kids coming up, um, you know, had the the access to the internet and they started having these. Um, presumptions as to what pro bodybuilders cycle look like and when you're taking and they go oh you know this guy's taking this much so I gotta do that and if I want to look that big and they, they just start disregarding the relevance of the nutrition disregarding the relevance of the training so back in the day when you know guys weren't so or the business wasn't so drug focused or uh, up, up and coming athletes weren't so drug focused they had all of their attention on wow I mean like I gotta optimize my training I learned how to do this properly like I, I gotta make the most of this and that was their primary focus and then when the internet came along and you started seeing these ridiculous cycles being posted by guys it's shifted from an intelligent training approach focus like I need to be awesome at training and now it's shifted to well how much drugs can I take and I think that's what took it away man is, is people just you know had a singular focus on uh, making the assumption that it's all your drug protocol, and it's the stupidest thing, man. Like, guys are hurting themselves, and you talk to the best pro bodybuilders in the world, and they're not the guys doing the most drugs. They're the guys who have are absolutely the most genetically blessed. Uh, that's always step one, right? Like, if you're going to be the best in anything in the world, like, which one of us in the room can go compete with Usain Bolt? Hmm. Right. No, you have a fucking chance. <laughs> but you know No matter that, how much uh, we train. Uh, yeah, no matter how many steroids Let's take in, out. fucking winning the hundred meters sprint, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, but that's that's what people's perception is. It's like, oh yeah, I, I mean, I, if I take that, I could go compete with these guys. Like you fucking moron, you like you have no chance. Like it's impossible. You and there's so many variables, um, but obviously, tr you know, to optimize your body for what you are capable of, training has to be number one, right? And steroids are, are an augment if that's your chosen direction. Yeah, when you it's funny we talk about that. Like if you take away the drugs, which obviously play a role in any uh, professional sport, but if you take those away, you're still dealing with a bunch of massive human beings. I mean, I've seen pictures of Jay Cutler when he was a teenager working out, and uh, I mean, he he looks <laughs> ridiculously impressive uh, to a level that I would never achieve, even probably with drugs. And I think people assume that the top guys are the ones taking the absolute most gear. Um, but I've, uh, having been in the world a little bit of, uh, of bodybuilding, having known bodybuilders, I know amateurs who've taken just extreme high doses of gear right. who look nothing like guys who, uh, you know, I know at the pro level who take a, a lot less. So there's a genetic component to training, but I think there might be a genetic component to how you react even to anabolics. Of course there is, man. And that's the thing you notice amongst the elite is 
they take the smallest amount and they respond extremely well. There's two things that I think kind of set um, the elite apart from everybody else is their sensitivity to drugs. It's massive. You know, a guy will take 200 milligrams of testosterone a week, which is therapeutic testosterone replacement therapy dose, and put on 25 pounds. Um, and also their ability to retain muscle, I think, is massive. So you watch guys, and, and uh, this is you know where I kind of separated myself from everybody else, or at least I, I saw a separation from everybody else. Some of these guys will take two, three months a year off training, and they won't lose any muscle. They'll be equally as lean, maybe not, maybe just you know a couple of pounds of fat or a little bit softer, but they don't really lose any weight. Like if I take two, three months off training, I get smaller. Like I look different, I get smaller, I get fat. Um, and that's the difference, man. As you notice that a lot, you notice that a, a tremendous amount with professional bodybuilders. These guys don't touch a weight for months, sit on their couch, play video games, and uh, they're still fucking huge. And I think that's a difference. You know, if we stop training, what are you going to look like? Yeah. <laughs> right? Like a swimmer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> or, yeah. Yeah. Or a cyclist, right? I would go 180 pounds. Like a, a, right. You know, yeah. th- I remember Turn having. Fat turd. I remember, I remember <laughs> having kids that worked for me as trainers that would be, you know, 22, 23 years old eating Taco Bell and just, you know, calories, man. Oh, and their programming was terrible and they just looked amazing. And that, Uh, to me, that was the the connection when I realized how much genetics play the first role like that. I mean, that's, that's the big piece. And I, I, you know, the average person would look at that guy and go like, Oh, he must be taking steroids because he looks this way. And it's like, no, if you only knew that the genetic piece is the, is the biggest piece. But now what I, what I'm afraid for, I'm curious to hear what you think. Like, you know, I only I only dabbled in the men's physique world for a little over two years, and uh, you know what? I, why I even got into it is I felt like men's physique was kind of the answer to bodybuilding getting out of control. That a lot of the, the average person <laughs> looked at bodybuilding right. and yeah. said, "These guys are just unobtainable. I could never look like this." Right. And so here's this new category that, hey, the average guy, if he trains right, diets right, could obtain this this look, this yep. natural look. Yep. And so that appealed to me. I thought, okay, I could I could hang with that. You know, I I know I don't have a, a physique to, you know, hang with a bodybuilder for sure. It was uncomfortable in a speedo. To be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. That was most so speedo. most men should be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, but what I saw when I got back there, I was floored by how many of these guys were taking uh, bigger doses than some of the, the big bodybuilder guys I know. Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? I don't know if it's getting worse or getting better. I'm, I'm not directly in the men's physique world, man. But there's definitely a, a misunderstanding as to what that entire um, section of the sport is. And I, I think I agree with you when I say like it should be the more attainable. Like, hey, man, I, I cannot have to take a whole bunch of gear and I can look this way and as long as I work really hard and eat really well I can look that way and uh, and is it human nature man people just want the shortcut and they want mm-hmm. to do it a lot faster and oh, I want to be there now I want to be Mr. Olympia now what about the fucking 10 years that every other guy has been putting in you know like relax take mm-hmm. your time and actually build on, build some appreciable muscle but to speak to your point man I think that uh, it's definitely being abused there too and it's unfortunate um but it's reality, man. And I, I honestly think that, and not taking anything away from the physique guys, man, but I think the difference is just the genetic predisposition. So the physique guys are just genetically smaller. They're 100% taking, they're agree. They're taking the same shit, probably more often, or maybe at the same amount. I don't know. Um, but the difference is just like, hey, these guys are genetically mesomorphic, and these guys are genetically ectomorphic who added some supplementation in it, and, and now they look that their genetic limit, right? I love that you went there because that's my theory is that I, I believe that that's really the biggest difference. I think people, I think people think they on the outside looking in, they see a guy like you and they compare the two of us. And they go right. like, Oh, you just must be taking you, four you times need, more. You more yeah. You're yeah. taking four yeah. times the dose. I am, Crazy. but that's not the no. case. That's not the case and at I, all. I mean, not to take anything again away from the physique guys, but I think it's just like, I think it's an unfortunate thing that they got away or they got the board short thing going because it's just an excuse for guys to go, well, I wasn't really good as a bodybuilder because my legs were shit. I didn't want to put in the work. Yeah. So I'm just going to throw some board them. shorts on. Yeah, that's not right, man. Yeah. Like, the, the point of being a professional athlete, if this is a professional sport, is the fucking work ethic and, and the amount of work it takes to get there and the amount of time. I grew up, and there was only men's bodybuilding and women's bodybuilding. And if someone said they're an IFBB pro, I put them on a pedestal. And I was like, fuck, I know what you went through. I know how much work, how much time, how many years, how many shows you had to win. It mm-hmm. was such a c- tremendous level of commitment. And now somebody says, you know, I've got an IFPB Pro card and people don't even Well, let's talk respond. about, you, you talked about last night a little bit about the social media sort of stars and how that sort of changed everything. Sure. With bodybuilding, like. Sure, yeah. I mean, bit. just what I said last night is you go to a bodybuilding show now and the bodybuilders don't have a lineup. You know, you see previous Mr. Olympias, Ronnie Coleman, Lee Haney, 
Jay's still got a lineup, but most of these guys are standing there, like, fucking twiddling their thumbs. And on the YouTube stars, and I won't throw names out, but guys who are complete idiots. I will. Joey Swole. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Swoles. <laughs> Whoever, man. Whoever. You know, like, whatever, yeah. whatever it is. But their lineup is three hours long. And it just speaks a lot about the reality of today. People want a glimpse into your life. They want to relate to you. And nobody puts um, credit on or, or any uh, merit on hard work mm. you know for me it's like i respect the, the only reason i got into bodybuilding man I is not is the zero is zero but vanity for me it was all about i want to push my body i want to push my mind oh, you guys can, you guys yeah. can see that now yeah I, I honestly thought i grew up as a lazy kid grew up in a lazy family and i fucking hated it i resented mm. it i always thought i was a very lazy guy so i'm like fuck that like yeah. I, never, the opposite I never want to identify with that so like now like i told you man at 40 years old i'm going to do all the, the navy seal training and stuff that's one of mm. my goals uh, just to prove, like, fuck that. Like, you can overcome that lazy, natural in, in tendency. So, so you, t you talked a little bit about now perhaps intentionally trying to shrink your body or go down <laughs> so that you could do all this other you kind of training. Out, I mean, you fucking I, had to go I, down. I yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, this is interesting <laughs> to me because, you, you know, you're 280 pounds. Dude. You're a big dude. Obviously, you. I mean, I know you were saying how you're not. You feel like you're not the most genetically gifted, but compared to the average person, you're another type of man, human. You got to realize, process. Man, yeah, yeah. you got to realize for the last twenty years of my life, one hundred percent of the time has been focused on accumulating building muscle. One hundred percent of my day, mm -hmm. twenty four hours a day, I've had this tunnel vision on. I'm going to be the the biggest, hardest motherfucker to walk this planet. Um, so when people go, oh, you know, he's just genetically big. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you show me show me what it looks like after 20 years of you having tunnel vision on something right, right. I train harder yeah. than everybody like that was my exclusive focus like if mm -hmm. I walked in the gym with somebody I don't give a fuck who it is if it's Ronnie Coleman I'm I'm gonna die or or I'm gonna win like mm -hmm. like I'm not gonna stop and that was always my mentality and uh, you know I'm not, not speaking to be arrogant just like that was just my attitude man it's like I just wouldn't stop um, so people see me and go oh, you're genetically best mm maybe at some level maybe I, I think what I had genetically given to me was shape you know, I had a, for a big guy I had pretty good shape um, you know am I as gifted as a flex wheeler obviously not um, but I obviously didn't build muscle as well as flex did either so uh, yeah, it was a very just different existence man but I, you know f for me speaking to losing you know what effectively will end up being 100 pounds of muscle it's yeah how do you do that it's wow. definitely going to be a long process it, it, you know what the biggest shift for me is man is, is not um you know, the training, it's shifting your paradigm around food because um, when you walk into a, a meal environment or you wake up in the morning, your natural innate instinct for the last 20 years has been eat, consume, to, and not only to, here's the, here's the funny thing people don't realize. When you're training to failure as a bodybuilder, you're often eating to failure. So it's not just like, <laughs> it's not just it's eating true. to, to, to ha eat food. It's like eating to fucking be completely satiated and like more than my body wants to consume. So you got to break that habit. I've been doing that for 20 years. You know, like, I don't want to fuck. I hated eating, man. It became, it became a job. And now you have to change that paradigm. So, like, I'll go a whole day without eating. But at the end of the day, your kind of innate instinct kicks in and you go, well, I'm going to eat till I'm full. And mm -hmm. you got you to have to sw switch that thought. Mm. So I think that for me so far has been the hardest thing is I'm trying to connect with the idea of, Hey man, you're not eating to be big anymore. You're just eating to be awesome. You're changing fit. your relationship with food yeah. and all that. You know, the, and the, the the quote we give is rather than um, you're eating to live, rather than living to eat. Mm -hmm. And there's a big separation there, man. Now, how long have you been uh, doing this this process, and have you lost any size since doing this? Yeah, I'm down 25 pounds, maybe 30 pounds. Um, Did that come off real easy, that first 25, 30? <laughs> no, man. <laughs> no, people think that, right? People are like, oh, you, you know, uh, to speak freely on your show, people are like, oh, you're going to take the needle out and it's all going to fucking deflate. And uh, comedy is like, I haven't done uh, even testosterone replacement therapy for, therapy for almost eight months. And I post wow. that to people and I think I'm full of shit. But I'm like, man, that's just fucking reality. Like my, my sex drive sucks, but I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to lose some muscle. So I kind of have a purpose. Yeah. Um, so have you rebounded at all? Are you testing your natural test to see if uh, it's up to normal or it's not still low, man. Mm. It's still low. Mm. Um, but yeah, I'm tested and I'm, I'm experimenting. I'm, I'm actually testing my blood every week. So that's kind of a new thing because I'm, I'm in the process of um, just trying to see how things affect my body. So here's what's fascinating to me about that. So I know you've lost 25 pounds uh, and you're saying your testosterone is low, but you're still a massive human being. And that just goes to show there's more than just that that goes into building muscle. And I wonder if because you trained so hard for so long and pushed yourself to that limit for so long and we're so singular focused that 
a substantial amount of maybe muscle fiber hyperplasia happen to where you've got permanent size to the point where you're going to lose muscle, but you're always going to look muscular so because you you've, keep the you've, frame there. You've yeah. created so much permanent, almost permanent muscle size. Yeah, and well, it needs to be a pure focus on catabolism. Like it needs to be complete opposite of what most people It's got to be such a mind fuck. It is, it's a mind man. Fuck, man. It, it really is because, like you know, you go through the whole day. I'll go the whole day without eating, and I don't think about it. But as soon as you switch and start eating, your brain goes. Like just consume everything in sight. So you have to like <laughs> slow down and control that innate hmm. response to consume. Uh, yeah, it's a very different shift, man. Like so, training is obviously very, very different. Um, you know, and it's it's funny that I find if I train even more than three times a week, I get bigger again because the amount of the threshold for stimulus is so low that any amount of stimulus I get, I go, you know, I grow. well because you're gaining back what you lost. Yeah. It's that whole muscle memory. You, right. Your satellite cells are just all over it's the funny. place. I'm so curious now. I'm like, if I if I kind of rent back up again, I'm like, fuck, it could probably be thirty pounds heavier I than bet I was you, before. I bet you. I yeah. bet you, you money. Yeah. You know, some of the be- some of the most impressive body. But I know Kevin Lavrone, I believe, used to do that. Right? Years. Yeah, he, he, would, just, he would shrink down and blow up, and yeah. shrink down and blow up, and almost would come back bigger each time. And uh, I mean, bodybuilders have talk, been talking about for for decades where the most anabolic that you'll ever feel is post show, right after show, right after yep. a show. Yep. But um, I just find it fascinating. You're telling this last night to us, and you're like, "Yeah, man, I haven't. I'm tr- I've been trying to kind of shrink down for like eight nine months, and my testosterone is low, and I'm not eating that much. And I'm looking at you going, "What? Like, right. how is this even possible?" But <laughs> so I, I want to speak to that first, man, because people are going to go, well, "Why are you doing that, man? Like, what the fuck's what's motivating you?" And I kind of want to talk to that because people, are, I know people are going to ask that question. Good. Yeah, I lost my purpose. So. As a young kid, you're driven, you're full of piss and vinegar, and you want to prove to the world and to yourself that you can do it. You can do anything. I can conquer the world. Everybody in the world said, man, you'll never be a professional bodybuilder. Everyone said you'll never get to the Olympia stage, never get to the Arnold stage. I did all that shit. Uh, and it wasn't at that point, it stopped being about proving any ball strong. It started being about, you know, telling myself that I could do anything. Uh, and then we talked about having kids. And uh, having kids shifted my paradigm. And I, like I said, I was I was a very focused guy. I was very driven, tunnel vision, like all about hard work and having that killer instinct. Very selfish. Very, very, 100% selfish. And you have kids, you can't be selfish anymore, man. Like my singular focus in life is my children. So did that uh, switch immediately when you saw it, when you had kids or did it take a second? I think it switched immediately, man. I, honestly, I don't know that it was a conscious thing. I know when, as soon as I had my daughter, my second mm. child, it switched yeah, like, yeah. instantly. I but, felt it. Yep. Same thing for me. Dude, it was weird, right? It's like God's giving you some sign. Uh, but anyways, uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you just Balance. become, yeah, you just become much more aware of your, your decision making. Yeah, uh, aware of your surroundings, aware of being your protective mechanisms for this other human being you're now responsible for. Uh, Yeah, it was very interesting. So speaking to why I decided to lose 100 pounds of muscle, man, um, I love bodybuilding. I fucking love it, but I don't love it for the vanity of it. Never have. I I think I spoke to you guys yesterday. You know, the closer I get to the contest, I'm down, you know, five, four, you know, maybe under 4% body fat at some point in my life. I don't know. Uh, I was when I was my most insecure. So Mm -hmm. I'm like, and I'm getting to this point in my life where I'm going, why would I want to bring that back into my life? I fucking hated how I felt. I hated Mm -hmm. the the being on stage. So at your most ripped, at your most muscular. This is where you and I connect so much. I hated the stage part. I loved the prepping for the show. I loved... I love getting ready for a show. That was my favorite part. I love getting into the science of paying attention to what I'm eating, my programming. I loved all that. Right. The getting up on stage and being judged and knowing that people Who are- Who the fuck? Yeah, that's I, exactly it, right? I it's didn't like, give a fuck about that. I loved working hard, man. I love yes. well, getting Yes, you're a pure athlete being, about it. Yeah. yeah and you get up there and, and ultimately I always called it the pageant. I'm like, why do yeah. I want to go up there? <laughs> and totally. Ju- and even if I was to so win subjective. Mr. Olympia- yeah. I don't know that I would have... Everyone goes, well, how did it feel to win your first pro show? And I go, fuck, man. Like, it didn't mean anything to me. Mm. Not to take anything away from bodybuilding, man, but it meant nothing to me. It was all in the process. You know, my greatest victories were when I actually had the best preparation and I didn't necessarily get the best result. If I had won Mr. Olympia, would I have felt good, better about myself? I don't think so, man. Unless the prep was fucking epic to the point where I know, like, I just smashed every workout. I was perfect in every meal. I'd worked harder than I'd ever gone before. And then the end result happened to be that I won the Mr. Olympia. That would have been fucking amazing. But if it would have been, you know, anything, one, one thing went wrong, I would have been focusing on that one thing that I could have done that better. And, and it wouldn't have been a victory for me. So it was never about the end result, man. It was always about the process and it sounds cliche but isn't it the reality it's, it's it is my reality that like i just fucking loved the work and i love the person that it made me to become a professional bodybuilder Fuck that, yeah that, that's one of that's one of the conversations if you, you guys don't follow jim Rohn, any one of the listeners out there follow jim Rohn. he's actually passed away but he's always the guy who said don't set the goal of becoming a millionaire for what for the money set the goal of becoming a millionaire for what it'll make of you to 
become it, to achieve it. Mm-hmm. Process. And that, yeah, man. Fuck, isn't that amazing, right? So yeah. that's that's what bodybuilding was for me innately, man. It was just uh, this this avenue to uh, develop an awesome inner being and become an awesome man and become a better representative for humanity. Well, I, I love to look at my physique after every show and see, and I didn't give a fuck about the judges because one judge will tell you one thing, another judge will tell you. So I didn't yeah, give a, a little shit. too much oil on your shoulder. Yeah, right. I didn't give a shit about what they had to say. <laughs> right. I, I looked at myself objectively and said, you know, hey, Adam, you could you could improve your delts here. Right. You could do this. And then I would love to go back to the drawing board, yep. build my programming up, get ready for a show, and then compare and contrast. That, that's, that, that was the best part of the Fuck contest, yes, it is, was. Is, is saying, man, I've been working for, you know, eight months or 12 months and this is what I was able to do. And if you didn't see it, then you're like, fuck, that was, that was discouraging. Right. If you didn't see the changes, maybe you're expecting. Um, yeah, man, that, that was all what it's always about. So having kids yourself. change that for sure, man, for sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're just the most amazing, uh, teachers. Uh, you know, people always say, what's your, what's your responsibility as a parent? And I say, you know, my responsibility is to keep them safe. Their, their job is to teach me. Um, I think that that's truthfully how, how it works. I mean, I look at them and I see, um, you know, every limitation I've ever had as a human. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what the, the things that their shortcomings is an indication of my limitations as a yeah. parent. So you see I'm, a lot of your insecurities dude, kind of play out uh, right sure. in front of you, right? And then yeah. you try and like of get them to avoid these things. And it's just like, you have to right. let it play out. So how can I yeah. be a selfish, you know, self-motivated prick when I see would see that manifesting in my kids? Like, it just doesn't make sense in my brain. Mm. So... And so the the reality is, why did I stop? Is I no longer had a purpose. I was like, what am I doing it for? Uh, Am I doing it to prove something? Nope. Am I doing it to make myself feel better? Nope. Like, so what am I doing, man? Ultimately, like, I love training. I can still keep training. I'm still training as hard as I can. Do I need to walk on around at 300 pounds? I'm 36 years old. Probably not. Um, So it's it's now trying to get into a fit. Uh, You know, I love the idea of being a, a role model or a kind of a figure in fitness. So I love the idea of um, you know getting in shape and doing some other type of physical endeavor. You know, we talked about Spartan races. We talked about maybe an Ironman. We talked about doing the Navy SEAL training. All that stuff is, is appealing to me, man, and getting back to my athletic roots. You know, the irony That's of rad. all that, uh, because you're also a very, I consider you one of the, probably the smartest businessmen in the bodybuilding world. Thank you. Um, the irony of what you're saying is that would be brilliant for business. Oh, yeah. To have an ex-pro bodybuilder Change and adapt sure. and train in these different ways. This is a ways. dramatic shift. I so, mean, I don't, so the thing is, people are like, "Oh, you're still going to be a big guy." I'm like, "No, I'm not going to be a fucking big guy. I'm going to be a small guy." Like, and people are like, "Bullshit." I'm what? like, "Watch." Yeah. So, you know, I want to go. <laughs> I want to go to like the opposite fucking pole, man. Like, uh, you know, that's just the mentality of of you better of an be elite documenting athlete. this whole process. Uh, well, 100 completely. pounds, yeah. and I tell people 100 pounds, I lose 100 pounds, they think I'm crazy, but. Uh, I don't just want to still be a kind of big guy. Like, I want to be able to do triathlons i want to be able to do like i've you know i've got this genetic if i do have a genetic gift it's my legs and if, if i have a gen, if i have a genetic gift i agree with it? you yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well why not use it right why not do some yeah. sprint cycling why not do some some track like palindrome type stuff uh fuck it's there you know mm-hmm. um to, and and use it and, I, and i've got a tremendous um innate uh endurance so that was kind of my if another thing if i was gifted with it was to be an endurance runner interesting mm. you're kidding me well actually no you were time. saying when you train with other pros the way you would crush them <laughs> is with Shh, volume don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that, that's my gift man so if you look at my my genome uh, my genetic testing um, my genetic gift is um my aerobic capacity mm. my endurance. so it's like viking and an aerobic capacity yeah i was a hell of a fucking march, marching viking, viking. <laughs> so exactly. i i want to circle back to the deep shit right i want to go back to the family <laughs> stuff because uh i, I immediately i immediately yeah i do and i and i immediately connected with you right away um your level of self-awareness mindfulness to to get somebody like that and you're a young age we're young still we're 36 year old both of us were 36 um did you? Would you say you had a, a rough childhood? Would you? Uh, introspective. I don't think it was rough. I, I don't. I wouldn't say I was. I wasn't abused. I wasn't uh, particularly neglected. I don't think. Uh, it was just a lot of time to observe. I was a very. I was always the observer, man. Mouth closed, ears open. Mm-hmm. You went. You went the opposite, like I did from my, my childhood, and I know that I had to work through a lot of animosity that I had towards. My parents or my mom. My father killed himself when he was seven. My mom remarried into an abusive relationship. And I learned a lot of what I learned was from seeing what they were doing. Sure. 
and yeah. going the opposite direction. So I was very blessed that I had my grandparents. Um, so my parents split up when I was young. Uh, my dad and I had basically no relationship. Uh, my mom was working. So um, I don't know that I had any animosity. I just had a lot of time to myself. Um, my grandparents were older-ish. They're great people, but older. Um, not Zero health consciousness. So, um, you know, just you know, existed. Um, so, yeah, I, I didn't have a bad upbringing by any stretch, man. Like, I was never abused. I was never, I mean, never beaten or anything like that. But um, it was just a lot of time to be by myself and observe. Now, were you uh, more of an intellect or more of an athlete? Uh, like we're, we're, I would say I was an athlete, man. Okay. Yeah, I didn't resonate at school, man. I was, I was like, a, I was a straight D student for most of my life. Oh wow! So here, here's I would have never guessed that because you're a really smart. Well, yeah, I grew guy. into that, man. I grew into that. So I, I just didn't like school, man. It was boring for me. And and here's the the funny part about school is, and most people f- find this funny, is I had a speech impediment and a learning disability. Um, so now the irony is like I teach people and I'm a public speaker, right? That's, the, that's always the irony of it, right? Is the things that maybe are your Dude. limitations as a kid, yeah. you turn into your greatest gifts. Um, so yeah, I mean, th- those are the two things I love to do. I love to teach and I love to talk. And uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. Do you remember the, because tur- I remember the turning point for me. I was a si- school, was not interested. I did, I did okay. I was a 3.0 student, but definitely didn't apply myself because mm-hmm. I, I wasn't interested and at 25, uh, I, there hit a switch where I started to read things that I was interested in. And then mm-hmm. it just, I became, I just started reading and reading and reading. But there was a moment in my life that I remember. Do you remember a moment where you kind of made that transition? I do, man. So uh, ninth, Canada, I was, in, I was in school. I went to ninth grade, uh, first year high school. And the high school I went to was in a bad area um, and uh, had no sports. So I switched into a new school which is actually near my dad's house. So I moved in with my dad. And at that new school, it was a completely, it was a complete paradigm shift for me with the people I was associating with. And every single person from that school went to university. Um, so I went from a school where literally when I graduated, one person, like, so if I'm looking back at when the school I went to in ninth grade, I knew that the graduating class had one person that went to university. And the mm-hmm. school that I went to in 10th grade, every single person went to university. Uh, and that was the shift for me is surrounding yourself with these people. And you're like, wow, I got these. It just was a massive paradigm shift for me to be like around these people who are all, you know, so my ninth grade, like my ninth grade homeroom was guy, probably every guy in the class would come in smung like glue, having huffed glue on the way into oh, wow. school kind of shit. That's oh, honest, shit. man. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, where am I? And none of them played sports. And, you know, I, I was very athletic and, and had kind of nowhere to, no outlet. So I go to this new school and I see all these kids who are really smart, good athletes, and I was just like, well, I, you know, I went from being the alpha male at the first school to now having to step up my game to be the alpha male at the mm. second school. So I just stepped up my game, man, and it was just kind of part of the crew. Like, it, you, you didn't fit in if you didn't go to school. They would make fun of you. Mm, <laughs> so yeah. that was kind of where I stepped up my game ago. I better start this reading thing. And I was always, like I said, I wasn't always an introspective guy. So at 14, I started doing endurance running, man, just because it was my outlet from uh, my life, you know, observing these people around me that I didn't want to be like. So my disconnect was I'd wake up every day at five o'clock in the morning and I'd run for two hours before school. Um, it was just my thing, man, like freezing cold, fucking Canadian winter. I'd be outside at five in the morning, literally every day running until I basically puked um, because it was my disconnection from the observation of the, of the reality that I was existing. Hmm. When did you find your passion for learning? Um, I think once I found something I liked, so, you know, I said, I started off with endurance running cause I like to push myself. And then, um, I found, I found training because I was an athlete and I was 15 years old and I wanted to become faster for sports. So my coach goes, Hey man, I want to go try the weight room. So I just started doing some legs and it was, it made me faster. So I literally went in every day before I practiced and before games to like, cause I was like, Oh, when I do this, it makes me feel faster. Uh, and then I started to respond. I started to grow. Um, so that was kind of the catalyst for, you know, 15 years old, you just going to the gym to train. And I literally went every day because I noticed when I trained, I was faster, I felt stronger or maybe felt more loose. Um, and then just progressed from there, man. Like it was never really an inspiration or, or a, a goal of mine to be a, a pro bodybuilder. It's just kind of something that... Now, did you, you, did you dive in and really uh, learn the science behind training at this point? Or was it just, I'm going to go do it? And then later on, you became much more of a, you know. So, yeah, I guess that didn't really answer your question. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my, my, learn, my, dis, my discovery of learning or my desire to learn happened when I was probably uh, 18 years old. So I found bodybuilding. And uh, that, because it was my passion, I tried to consume everything. And, I, and uh, I tried to find the one guy. I think one of us were talking about this. I think it was you, actually. And we were talking about trying to find that one bodybuilder who you could kind of attach to and be like, oh, I want to follow this guy. And he didn't exist, man. Like, mm. nobody existed. At least I couldn't find him. 
Um, and I, so it just became this self journey of trying to find, you know, fill in the gaps. Like, what should I be eating? How should I be training? Um, you know, what should I be taking? What should, what, how, what should my sleep look like? What should my daytime routine look like? And trying to model it after somebody and then end up being, unfortunately, there was nobody out there. So it was just kind of this, um, you know, plethora of people that I was pulling information from. That must have been really tough because we should share with the audience that you kind of represented that guy for me because I was getting into a world that I knew nothing about. Right. I was not like Sal. Sal was somebody who followed all the old time bodybuilders, was into that. I was always just an athlete. Like I love sports. I was competitive. And I purely got into the sport for business reasons. I'm sure. 30 years old and I saw the opportunity. And so right away, I began searching for, you know, the guys that knew. With, and, so, and I'm searching for the same stuff, my sure. sleep, my diet. Yeah, like how you're not fi- following And I'm anybody. not finding yeah. anybody. And I'm going, Jesus. And there is nobody. Yeah. And, and so, that's the, so that's kind of a dichotomy. We spoke about this, too, is I'm pretty um, – I don't know if I'm introverted, man, but I'm a private guy. You know, mm-hmm. like I'm not a guy who's going to go out on social media and post shit about my life. And I almost should because there's probably guys – there's probably thousands of guys out there like Absolutely. you yeah. looking for it. And, and I have to be honest. A lot of people take your int- think you think you're an asshole. They do. Fuck you, man. Yeah, no. They, they really, they, 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 like, like when I, people, I had a lot of people ask me uh, when we were coming over here, like, yeah, find out. I think, he, I think he's Turns an out you're a big sweetheart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what the hell? Right. No, yeah. no. You, and you're incredibly self aware and mindful and respectful and just, uh, I mean, an incredible guy. Uh, okay. Even nicer than what, and I knew because I dug deeper. I'm not somebody to judge after I just see something. I'm going to, I've, I've learned more about you to do that, but. Uh, you, because you have kind of more of an introverted, quiet personality, people took that as an arrogance. And we kind of talked about that. Yeah, that's the thing is it's not introverted. It's extroverted, but it's selectively extroverted. Mm. Like, I'm not going to let everybody into my life because I don't want everybody in my life. I've had that taste of quote unquote fame. And, you know, it's not for me, man. Like, I, I like the idea of helping people. I love helping people. But at the same time, I don't have to be the guy who's the center of attention. I don't have to be the guy who's standing on a pedestal with my shirt off, getting everyone go, oh, you look great. It's not my thing. So I kind of disconnected because I want to keep my family life private. I want to keep my personal life private. But like we speak about, man, maybe there's a benefit for me, you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm starting, you know, I'm starting with the podcast. I'm starting as my body, my life shifts away from bodybuilding. Maybe it's affording me the opportunity to get a little bit deeper into what actually happened behind the scenes, mm. uh, what my life does look like. And I mean, I've just always been a private person because that's just who I am. I don't like the idea. I'm not a spectacle guy, man. Like as much as that yeah. sounds contradictory, like but you know, it's what? funny because I can completely identify. You know, and I think you kind of picked up on that even at dinner. It's yeah. like it's one of those things. It's like I don't like the center of attention. Sure. I don't like being the guy on the spot and right. like has all the answers and let me just do my thing. Yeah, and, leave me alone. You know, leave me alone. And yep. um, and so just for me to kind of even become part of the group and, and express myself uh, through a podcast was such a big challenge for me. But like I seek these opportunities to challenge myself Mm -hmm. and I feel like you're the same way with that as far as like getting yourself out there and you know this is something where I can improve and and, and project myself in this light yeah I've got a pretty cool platform um, in front of me and it's just a matter of picking and choosing how you want to kind of leverage it right so yeah obviously I can go out there and drop my pants and and get a bunch of likes (laughs) and well, literally, really yeah. too, right? Like, hey, I'll show you my quads. And a bunch and of I'll, pennies. And I'll, and I'll get yeah. 20,000 likes, uh-huh. and that'll be fucking awesome for about five minutes, and then I'm going to feel insecure about myself again. And I'm just not, the, I'm just not someone who builds my self-worth based on other people's judgments. Mm. So why the fuck do I care what you mm. think? Like, right. ultimately. So you were so for so long, you were judged uh, based on your appearance, your aesthetics, <laughs> the your size, it, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. For so long, and now you're making a very, very sharp pivot. What would you like to be known for now? Good question, man. And so that's funny. I'm actually leaving today to go on a vacation with my family. And it's just a week of introspection. It's a week of journaling. It's a week of literally identifying that. It's who are you? What are the hats that you wear? What does your life look like in 10 and 25 years? Who do I want to be known as now, man? I, I don't know that I have a clear depiction of that. I, I, you know, honestly, what my entire the entire focus of my career has been is I want to be that guy that Adam's speaking about that anyone can turn to about if I want to learn how to build muscle and, and be an awesome dad, a great businessman, and you know, the, ult, ult, the ultimate modern man, ultimately, right? Like, mm. ha, I want to be that guy. Like, I want to be fucking ripped, and I want to have great sex with my wife. I want to love my wife. I want to be a fucking awesome dad to my kids. So when my kids grow up, they go, my dad was my superhero. Mm. I want to make a million dollars a year, but not because I need, I need millions of dollars worth of material shit, but because it allows me an opportunity to travel the world, see new people, meet new people, and help new people. That's probably the ultimate definition of what my life looks like in five years mm, you know? sounds awesome yeah right i mean i think a lot of people can relate to that if they take the time to step back and identify what it looks like and most yeah. people don't right but luckily for me 
uh, I make time for a lot of introspection and, and answering that question, you know, but I think I need to dig deeper too, just like anybody. Mm -hmm. I think I need to get really specific on what it looks like, where am I living, who's in my life, uh, and who's, whose life I'm impacting and in what specific way, because you can't impact everybody's life or you can impact nobody's life. Yeah. We, we had some pretty good discussions last night on, I mean, a whole gamut of health optimization, everything from gut grinder. health to brain. <laughs> yeah, great. We introduced <laughs> you to <laughs> Grinder. We didn't have to educate you a little bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, showed um, them some pics. Yeah, brain yeah. optimization. Like, what are the subjects that are really piquing your interest now? All of the above. Um, so, I, I, man, I, it's going to sound arrogant as fuck, but I think I've kind of mastered the muscle building thing. So my execution... You can say that. Yeah, yeah man. I, yeah. <laughs> You're allowed to say that. Yeah, I mean, I don't <laughs> the know that... The there, pictures, yeah. I don't know that there's very many humans on the planet who get it as well as myself and my staff do. You know, we, we're pretty, we pretty get it. We get it, man. Like, we get the execution component. We get the programming component. We get how to, to nourish it as much as we can. Obviously, there's a lot of answers in, mm -hmm. in, in, that aren't there as far as research and that's necessary. Uh, but I think I get the muscle building component, the execution, um, you know, the weight of everything and, and how to balance all those factors. And now for me, it's optimizing brain, performance, uh, consistency. Um, so we talked about the idea of self-mastery. So what does that really mean, right? Overcoming limiting beliefs, uh, not allowing anyone to influence you, um, you know, being secure in your, in your personal values um, so that nothing, nothing in no situation ever sways you from the man that you are inside. Um, and, and obviously being a good or, you know, ultimately being a great uh, role model for my kids, man. That's what it comes down to for me. So. That's what I call being a Jedi. Yeah. It takes fucking some serious Dude, mastery and to do so, that. And we need, we need a word. We need a word. Like, we need to be like, um, we're doing this. So, like, I, I always connect with the ultimate modern man. I'm like, okay, you know, and it may, it may or may not be the term, but we need to create a word. Yeah. It doesn't exist. Like, if it was, you're an alpha. I'm like, fuck that. Alpha's, like, old and, and has weird... It's yeah, yeah, too much bro connected to alpha. Yeah, 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 yeah. There needs to be some word, and we need to create a word. Maybe we'll create a word today. What do you think? I like Jedi, I like wizard. Man. It's I know. Wizard. Yeah, I like but, wizard. But when you say Jedi, people think of something else. So I, I want to think of a word that everyone's like, hey, man, that's exactly what it is. You know, the ultimate modern man is like, I'm connecting with all of these things. You know, I want to master my, my body, my mind, my relationships, my business, my 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 longevity my environment and my, my insides mm -hmm. like that's a shit like i want to fucking be the king of all those not just one and let's create the single now word. let's 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 talk about longevity for a second yep. um because bodybuilding at that level is not known for being <laughs> great for sure. longevity on any pretty at, much on for any, many levels yeah. on many levels what do you do now uh in terms of training nutrition and you know i don't know you, you talked about doing yoga four days a week now sure. and stuff like that what are some of the things now you implement in turn for longevity in particular <laughs> Um, meditation is step one, man. And it sounds cliche, man, but it, it's one of those things that if you've never done it or you, you're thinking about it, you got to try it. If you don't have to, uh, oh, we talk about it all dude, the time. just the yep. ability to eliminate the bullshit, eliminate the noise that the world is trying to pull you in all these different directions is so important, especially in this time right now, oh. we are becoming more and more, uh, disconnected and present with all these tools that, I mean, how often now do you sit, look around at a dinner table and see people are all on their, they're not even connected to the people that are sitting right and fucking in front of them. Right. So if there was ever a time that it, it's important to be present, and I don't think there's anything out there that I've ever put into practice that has helped me like meditation, like meditate yeah. that. I mean, and I'll tell you what, it, it's actually was difficult and we talk about the the challenge because we all uh, shared our first experience of trying to meditate because I went after it the same way like my my athlete mindset yeah. like gonna I'm gonna meditate you know, like yeah. you, you, know, you can't go in like that no you can't meditate hard yes yeah. you can't do that you right. can't say I'm gonna I'm gonna meditate so hard today and it's uh, the another a big paradigm shattering moment for me with it was that it's a practice. Yeah. So it's like my, it's imagine, imagine this, imagine going to the gym for the first time and trying to squat. It's going to fucking suck for a be while. Uncomfortable as shit. It's going to suck. You're not going to feel it where you want to feel it. You're going to be shaky. You're not going to have good mobility and you know, all of the above. <laughs> right. Well, the first time you go and meditate or even the first 10 times you go and meditate, right. you're just going to sit there and think about the fact that you're wasting your time. And I think setting expectations is massive. That's one of the things we talk about with the trainers here is you, know, you got to set someone's expectations. Like, what are you expecting to get out of this? And I think if people just realize, like, hey, I'm going to go into that, your brain is going to get distracted. That's okay. And, like, you know, coming to terms with, hey, man, your brain's going to want to think about everything. That doesn't make you a bad person. Just do your breath, to, do your focus to bring it back. Do your best to focus on bringing it back to the breath. And keeping it, um, you know, very, very easy, very flowing. And that's, that's really all it is, man. It's just 
eliminating the monkey mind, man. Well, it's such a simple thing. Now, knowing the, this, knowing about meditation and doing it now, do you think that would have benefited you in the 20 years of uh, as I bodybuilder? Think, I think for sure it would have, but I think training was my meditation, and I think that's oh, I why see. I talk that about That was your flow state. Yeah, dude. I think that's why I talk about when someone entered it. Like, if someone would get in my way, it'd be like, why the fuck did you just get in my meditation? Like, if yeah. someone, if you're sitting at, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning over the time you meditate, and somebody walks up and kicks you in, in the face or something, you'd get up and you'd probably fucking smash something over their head. Right. That was my state, right? That was like, man, if I'm in this state, like I got my hat on, I got my headphones on, regardless if it was music playing or not, when I was training, I was just so zoned out, man. If you broke that, I was fucking pissed. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Um, so same thing now, man. Like if I was meditating somewhere and I was like deep into my, you know, my flow state and somebody came over and like startled me, I might not, I might, I might not smash them like I might have in the past, but now I'd at least be like startled. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, I'd be like, fuck it. You, su- you surprised me. So that was the same thing, right? As a fear based response previously, it was like, mm-hmm. well, you, you, you know, you came into this world you weren't supposed to be in. I thought I was here by myself. Um, so yeah, man, that, I mean, that's, that's all meditation is, right? Is um, getting into that um, state where you block the rest of the world. How often do you do it now? I try to do it every day. So I get up every day at four thirty. Um, and my first practice is, uh, I brush my teeth, I clean my, clean my teeth. Um, and then I, I meditate. Um, and sometimes if I'm, if I'm up late with assholes like you at night, <laughs> I don't get up at four <laughs> thirty. but, uh, but yeah, man, so there's certain days I miss, but, uh, if I can control it, I, um, I meditate. And so if we, if we didn't have a plan on training today or doing a podcast, I probably still would have got up at four thirty and did my meditation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just would have assumed that I'm not going to train later because, you know, training on four hours of sleep usually ends up sucking. Or if I have to do something that requires a lot of focus, it's going to end up sucking. So I decided to sleep in a little bit today, which was five o'clock. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and then, you know, we knocked out the workout in the podcast and my brain still works. But if I find if I get less than five hours of sleep, my brain's pretty shit. Mm. So. so I know a lot of our fans are going to be like, I want to hear all his muscle building advice and all, you know, because you, 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 you said yourself, you've mastered a lot of what goes behind hypertrophy sure. and muscle building? What are some of the th- some of the suggestions or ideas or, I guess the the big rocks when it comes to hypertrophy to building muscle because that's something that you're so well versed in. Sure, man. Um, you know, within the business, so my business is MI40, as you guys know, and we've created a we try to create a uh, kind of a, kind of a framework where people can latch onto and at least give them a jumping off point. Um, and I think the biggest thing that um, maybe is a paradigm shifter in the beginning for people is creating an internal focus as opposed to an external focus. What do you mean by that? I'll explain. Mm-hmm. Um, so internal focus, what goes on? Well, so let's talk about external focus. What's, ex- what's outside your body? Um, bars, dumbbells, machines. Um, people are focused on what's going on inside of their body. And what you want to do is you want to shift your focus to an internal focus. So let's think about what this muscle is doing. If I'm trying to train a muscle, the only thing that matters is what's happening at the muscle. It doesn't matter how much weight is in my hand. It doesn't matter what machine I'm doing to do it. People get this this bias or attachment to certain things or certain exercises and like, oh, I have to do this exercise because, you know, Ben Pekulski did this exercise or Tom Platz did this or, or fucking Jay Cutler, whoever. And they get this attachment and without realizing that everybody's body is different. So if you can create an internal focus um, and focus on what the muscle is doing and realize that muscular contraction is relatively simple, it's... Um, pulling an insertion closer to an origin that's it so if i can conceptualize and visualize like and a lot of times for me this is closing my eyes you guys probably saw that when i was training a lot of times it's very internal uh, i close my eyes and i envision bringing my insertion closer to my origin and that's it and if i can so there's there's a few other things we latch on to from that or we add on to that and so it, it's important realization that if both ends of a muscle are moving you're not getting any attention to the muscle it's the idea if i'm holding this rope in my hands and both ends of the rope are moving, how much tension can it create in the, in, the, in the rope? Zero. So one end needs to be anchored, the other needs to be generating tension. So when you're, when you're training, one end needs to be anchored, one end needs to be as stable as possible. So our, my main focus is I need to stabilize my body, create a stable jumping off point. So the idea is you, know, you can't fire a cannon from a canoe. So stabilize your body as much as possible, and this term I often use is lock it down, and then generate tension in the muscle at the other end and bring the insertion closer to the origin that's it and then once you find that and then it's a matter of okay well now i found it how long can i keep it and how much can i stress it and how much can i how much tension can i create and how much can i appropriately disperse that amount of tension over the entire range of motion and then loading it so what you're really trying to do the entire time and this is what one thing that bodybuilding has contributed 
um, I think, greatly to fitness is the ability to connect mm -hmm. to individual muscles. Now, from a personal trainer standpoint, when we're training clients, the average person who just wants to get in better shape, a lot of times they're completely disconnected to their body. Completely. Um, in fact, uh, I can't tell you how many times I'll do a tricep press down and a client would ask me where they're supposed to feel right. it. Right. Yeah. Where am I supposed to feel this? Right. Well, they don't know. And, and that's why I, I try to detach from names of exercises, man. Like, you know, if I say a bench press and I go, guys, what does that work? And everyone goes, oh, it works your chest. And that's just fucking bullshit. No, it doesn't. It works whatever I want it to work by how I mm. set up for the exercise and how well my mechanics determine. So a bench press may be an awesome exercise for me and maybe a terrible exercise for you. And acknowledging that, I can turn a bench press into a lat exercise for you. I can turn a bench press into a rear delt and tricep exercise for you. Just by changing what you're thinking about, maybe your body position a little bit. I, you know, I can make it an exercise that works absolutely zero chest. Mm. We could take Justin in the gym floor right now, and he could do a chest exercise with zero pec. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, well, that's interesting. So disconnecting from what you think is happening, those biases you have and attachments you have to exercise and the name of an exercise, mm. and trying to train the muscle. And, and that's a very dichotomous thought process from you know, CrossFit and things like that, where it's just training a movement. And I have nothing against that, man. If you're training for powerlifting, you're training a movement, that's completely different thought process. But if you're training for hypertrophy and you're training to optimize your body composition, transform your body, it's not an external focus. It's a 100% internal focus. And, and that's a very different paradigm for a lot of people, man. It's like, you know, what your, why do your eyes need to be open when you train? Mm -hmm. They don't mm -hmm. fucking think of what's happening in the muscle. Like, I, would, should you squat and do shit like that? Obviously not, right? Like, you need to be aware of what your surroundings when you're squatting, you're doing shit that's <laughs> complex. But if you're doing something like lateral raise or, or a dumbbell press or something where you're safe, fucking close your eyes. Think about what's actually happening and eliminate all the bullshit around you. Like, it's meditative. So, mm -hmm. question on that then. So, uh, you know, I'm, let's say I'm doing a tricep press down and I'm really focusing on what my tricep is doing, really isolating it, get that mm -hmm. contraction getting that full extension, why, in your, and this has been a debate for a long time, and there's lots of theories, but I don't think anybody's ever really explained why a close grip uh, bench press or a dip is going to build, typically in people, more tricep than something where you may even feel the tricep more like a tricep extension. Well, it, it's not. So th Okay, let's go there. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, it, that's what I say. Detach from your attachment to exercises, right? So. The only, the only singular thing that's going to be correlated with growth is increased muscular tension. So you just would argue, well, that muscle's putting more tension through it. So why, let, let me ask you this, man. Why would a lying tricep extension or a lying close grip bench press put more tension through a tricep than a tricep pushdown? The singular reason is stability. So if I'm lying with my back and my scapula's pinned to a bench or on the floor, it's important to realize that the long head of the tricep inserts on the scapula or originates on the scapula so if that scapula is moving which it often is when i'm doing a tricep push down mm -hmm. mm -hmm. i can't drain any, any tension at long head so if i lay on the floor and i artificially stabilize that scapula by shoving into the bench or into the floor i've just created a stable environment for that long head to now recruit more out of so that would make a lot of sense as to why maybe then i could create more tension perhaps use more load and thereby it would translate to more growth uh, but it's not a better exercise. Nothing is a better or worse exercise. It's all the same shit. It's all just a matter of creating tension in the muscle. That's, that's, it. Wow. that's a great way to argue that. That's, a, that's an excellent way to argue that. If the volume is the same, then you're, you're right. But that's the difference, really, is that somebody is more than likely going to be able to close grip, bench press, you know, 100, 200 pounds. Just because they're creating a more stable environment. Right. So if you if you were to load, you're, you're obviously a very strong guy, Adam. If you were to load the tricep push down, what's the first thing that, that breaks on a, tri on a tricep push down? Like, so if you think about, it, I've got perfect form, I got this shit locked in, I'm starting to get close to failure, what happens? Yeah. Do you triceps fatigue first? No. Fucking never. No. It's always you start internal rotation in your yep, shoulders, shoulders or you in. shrug your, your shoulders up. So what's happening at the scapula? Ah. Moving. Yeah. So how much, gen how much tension am I generating in that long head? Very little. Like, it's still generating some tension, but it's not maximal, right? Because I'm getting motion at my scapula. As soon as that scapula moves, the long head can't work. Why do people get elbow problems? Well, you got these three heads of the tricep that are capable of working. The long head shuts down a lot of times because the scapula is not stable. So you got these two heads trying to kick up, doing twice as much work to try to compensate for the long head, which is the big one, primarily as far as size. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's trying to compensate doing twice as much work and they get fucking inflamed because they can't handle the amount of load that you're trying to put on it and you're trying to move. It's like, why does every bodybuilder more level problems? So here's, just don't know. So here's the counter to that because uh, it all goes down to the central nervous system. It all goes down to being able to connect
connect to that muscle, activate it with as much tension as possible, which is a central nervous system. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, a, it's a CNS signal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we do know that when you activate more of your body, um, in other words, if, uh, if I were to have you squeeze something as hard as you could with your hand and isolate just that area where the rest of you were stabilized, you would be able to squeeze much harder if you squeezed your entire your body sure. along with your hand. Why? And this, because you're... you're Creating a stronger stable signal environment. Signal. No, it's just a stable. Yeah, it's stronger stable signal, but you're also creating a stable environment. So maybe this way may, may be why a barbell squat or a barbell row or an overhead press is more effective than let's say an isolate isolated Define movement. Effective uh, at building even the target muscle. No. So you're saying a, a side lateral done um, in a stable environment would build uh, a deltoid as much as a say a standing overhead press. No, because it's a different, it's a different, different movement. play. Okay. Yeah, it's a different plane. But so, if we were to compare the exercise we did today, the mm-hmm. cable side lateral against a dumbbell side lateral, okay. which one builds more muscle? Uh, see, I would have a tendency to say dumbbell. It's not correct. It, it comes down well. Obviously, load being equal, okay. if we equate load. Okay. Um, That's the real thing, right? To me, it's sure. load and volume that really matters. Well, it's load and then time under tension, volume. Mm-hmm. So yes. The time under tension with the cable would be greater because we did a better job of, of matching the resistance profile to what my body's capable of. So with the dumbbell, at the top, it's heavy as fuck. Right. To come down to the bottom, there's nothing there. Right. With the cable, because of the direction we chose for the cable coming across the body, as soon as I move, it's loaded. So I've got, in, instead of just being maximally loaded at the top, it's going to be maximally loaded through the entire range. So I would argue that you would get substantially more hypertrophy from that cable op- uh, that cable version rather than the dumbbell version. Now, from, a, from, I, from the way you're arguing it, it does make sense. From an experience standpoint, I've seen people do so much better with free weight movements, and that's also the, you know, the common, if you will, common knowledge uh, in the muscle building world. Is it because then maybe people are able to generate more tension uh, with, with free weight movements because they're, I don't know, adapting to them differently or able to use them differently or are you just saying no that's just incorrect all the way across so you're saying that people will get better results from dumbbells that tends to be the common knowledge right free weights everybody says free weights is going to build more muscle than a machine or a cable that is straight ignorance okay not from you sure but from the paradigm no and i don't mind it's, it's, listen no, it's I, just straight ignorance. okay there, there's zero fucking benefit to a dumbbell compared to a cable. And everyone's going to jump on my nuts for that. Yeah. But anyone who understands biochemistry, anyone that understands biomechanics, would, n- would know the answer. Okay. Like it's, it's, it, close your eyes. It's just fucking load. It's mm-hmm. just tension. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It doesn't matter that it's a machine. It doesn't matter that it's a dumbbell. Your body, how does the fuck does your body know? It's mm-hmm. like, think about it. Like if I'm loading my muscle, but does my body know if this is a cable or a, like, or a dumbbell? Or a fucking kettlebell or a shake weight. Right, right. It doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, I no. love you through shake weight today. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't know. That's why my right arm hey, is so Hey, 1,000 shake weights just sold across America. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sponsored by shake weights. <laughs> <laughs> the number one ad- ad- advocate across America. Um, yeah, no, it doesn't know. Um, so what's, what's the argument for a, a dumbbell? Uh, probably marketing. Okay. Probably the fact that 25, 30 years ago, Joe Weider said, I'm going to sell you a set of dumbbells because these are the best for training. And it's been indoctrinated into our, our thought process from a young age. Mm. There's no difference. And you're man. speaking from a purely hypertrophy standpoint. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Functionally, man, if your goal is something different, it's something different. Mm-hmm. But mm. hypertrophy, my goal is I need to stabilize the environment. I need to load the muscle. That's that's Glad the you made that distinction. Well, yeah, no, yeah, I sure. Mean, yeah, a, yeah. It, that's important um, because obviously, you know, weights are going to load you differently than machines are going to load sure. you. and. If you're looking for broad spectrum performance and all these different things, you want to be able to completely, utilize. man. If you're trying to be an athlete, it, it's it's often and should be a movement based emphasis, mm-hmm. not a muscle based be- emphasis. Yeah, we're talking right? purely hypertrophy. Yeah, so and that that's an important realization. I'm distinction I'm going to make right now. If you're training for hypertrophy, it's not the same as training for athletics, and it shouldn't be. Like I dissuade athletes from training muscle isolation most of the time, mm-hmm. uh, unless there's a glaring weakness. Mm-hmm. It will often decrease your performance so because you want that elastic response when you're training for sports right you want to train that ability well, to and have you want it. your entire body to communicate with it when yeah. you're doing a sport yeah. versus yeah. when yeah. you're getting you on want, stage and presenting signal. something yeah. completely different totally right? and different. if it's not on stage even if it's just like hey i'm trying yeah. to transform my body which is going to be more metabolic demand on the body so you're going to burn more fat with this this muscular type training transformation style training 
um, it's just a different thought process, mm-hmm. man. So everyone disconnect from the idea that I'm saying, hey, you need to do this. This is exclusive no, we're talking, to muscle building. Yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. I want to make sure that you know all those people at home that are clenching their butt cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> no, all, this all is all the great. CrossFitters that are pissed right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no, Fuck that guy. Come got, on, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got trolls on my page right now. <laughs> yeah. No, this is great, and this discussion Bullshit. needs to happen. And I'm glad you said that uh, because um, there are different ways to train for different particular goals. We're talking about optimally for purely hypertrophy based reasons I mean heck our our program Maps Aesthetic incorporates machines for that purpose for that particular purpose because uh, you know when you look at the highest level of any sport you're going to learn something from it and bodybuilders are the if you look at the entire sports arena nobody can feel and isolate a muscle like a bodybuilder nobody can connect to an individual muscle like a bodybuilder and that's what you're talking about specifically but, yeah man but even disconnecting from the fact that I'm a bodybuilder uh, I'm, a, I'm a biomechanics uh, student yes you know like I've got a kinesiology degree I've studied biomechanics for the last 15 years um, and I've learned from the brightest people in the world and uh, you know it's it's not just that hey this guy's a bodybuilder like I've, I that's kind of my I don't identify as a bodybuilder right like I'm saying a bodybuilding bodybuilding is what I do not who I am kind of thing mm-hmm. so um, yeah, man, I've studied it inside out, and uh, I think the thing you'll realize is the the higher you get to the top of the totem pole, um, everyone talks the same language. Everybody says the same thing. So mm-hmm. now, being a guy who is transitioning from uh, being a bodybuilder and kind of being more functional based, how does your how does your training start to mold and change? Are you still training purely hypertrophy or are you doing a lot more functional type stuff yeah, I, mean, I don't know that i'm doing very much functional stuff i just i want to maintain uh, a certain level of aesthetic i want to maintain a, a large degree of my strength uh and mobility and um, starting like i said transition into more athletic endeavors so i want to be able to sprint i can still sprint man but i just end up hurting my ankles and i'm hurting my hips and shit like I want to transition, like, and I know it's just pounds off the joints. Like, I got to take some pounds off the joints, right? Like, my ankles, my knees, my hips are going to hurt if I sprint. It's just, it, it is what it is. Um, so, it's transitioning into um, maintaining as much strength as you can while still not training to the point of, hey, I'm going to build muscle because mm-hmm. it's a different stimulus. So, I'm trying to be, maintain as much strength as I can while improving mobility, improving. Oh, I mean, all, my overall strength is pretty balanced. Um, so my body doesn't tend to have very many injuries, knock on wood. Um, but yeah, so the idea is maintain as much of, of a balanced symmetry and a balanced strength as I can as I gradually transition to this lighter body weight. That enables me to train more. Well, let, let's let's talk about that. What does that look like? Because this is this is something I'm currently going through myself. Like sure. I went, I was one side the men's physique, you know, focus all on aesthetics. Then I went the complete hippie, crunchy, meditate, sure. yoga looking guy, and now I'm trying to find this balance myself and i have things that i'm doing and incorporating i'm curious to like your approach on that what yeah man um training is is a little more scarce it's a little more infrequent um two or three times a week and honestly i'll be honest it's it's a new process man like my whole life for the last 20 years has been exclusively consumed with you know eat sleep train grow eat sleep train grow and now it's uh you know predominantly based on what I look like in the mirror and how I feel and when I'm doing shit, like when I'm performing stuff. So my training right now is based on, I try to make sure that I get everything in twice a week. So I'm kind of doing like an upper body, lower body split. Mm-hmm. Um, and volume determined is, is determined exclusively. Honestly, this sounds ridiculous, but by aesthetic, like if something looks like it's it, like, I'm going by this visual ideal that I have in my brain, like, Hey, I want to build this and I want to build that. Or, you know, I want to maintain this certain visual appearance. Well, if my arms look like they're getting small, I do a little more arms. And if like my legs aren't going to get small, you know, like <laughs> so, it's not like I, it's not like I'm doing legs often enough that I'm trying to hypertrophy them. I'm just doing them to maintain mobility, maintain you know structure around the joints, uh, and still be able to squat six hundred pounds a, when I'm forty. It's a dance because you want to atrophy, but you don't want to lose function because atrophy right. uh, goes hand in hand with losing yeah, function. It's a, it's a very unique, uh, I mean, I've never obviously experienced this. I don't know if very many people have, like who's ever mm. tried to lose hundred pounds of muscle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to cut yeah, your yeah, weight yeah. off. Well, maybe there's, maybe there's an attachment or a relation with like an ex NFL football players, mm. like ex NFL lineman, like Michael Strahan. I'm sure he lost hundred pounds. are pretty damn close to sure. it. Sure. Yeah. Um, so some of those guys maybe can relate to what I'm doing mm. and are trying to lose a ton yeah, of Yeah, but mass. he did the, uh, Slim fast or whatever. What yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Jenny Craig. Oh is there God. is there anything in terms of supplementation that you're doing for that? I mean, I'm wondering if the body's metabolizing that much muscle or adapting at that direction. Does that? Because I've never 
even contemplating what that could mean for the organs. Does that change anything? Are you looking at I think elevations in CK level and all that stuff? No, uh, all my all my liver enzymes are great. Um, all my kidneys look great. Um, my protein consumption is much lower. Like I talked about, it's about 120 to 150 grams a day. That's I fucking love hearing you say that, dude. It's so yeah. It well, felt I actually felt awkward last night having to uh, order 15 ounces of fish because it was my only second meal of the day, sure. and watching you eat half the size of the protein sure. <laughs> being yeah. twice my size. Yeah, I mean my meals by now people would laugh. It's like I I, I always eat of a bowl. I don't know why I have this fucking strange attachment to eating of this big wooden um, uh, big wooden bowl. And it's, I got a big Red Bull. That's yeah, I, I have the same <laughs> big Red. I <laughs> dump all my food. Yeah. That's <laughs> funny. Okay, well, I'm I don't feel like an idiot anymore. Um, but it's fucking vegetables. It's like ninety percent vegetables. So I literally will have like a pound to two pounds of vegetables, and I and like different like salads and green beans and broccoli and like everything. And it's always changing. And then I have like this little serving of meat and like a big chunk of fat. Like so, depending what it is, if it's if it's uh, coconut oil, if it's avocado, if it's some fatty meat, um, you know that's that's literally it. So it's predominantly most of my my volume right now is coming from vegetables. And, How many uh, grams of protein did you eat when you were uh, competing and trying to build? Good question. Were you were yeah. you one of the like eat you know five million grams of protein, or were you still yeah. were you even conservative there? Or? No, man, I, I went through phases. Um, so it was kind of dependent on one on my carbohydrate intake. So okay. if my carbohydrate intake was high, my protein intake was low. Um, if my protein, if my carbohydrate intake was low, my protein intake was higher. So carbohydrate obviously has a muscle sparing effect. So mm -hmm. if I was taking in, you know, 12 to 16 ounces of carbohydrate per meal, so, you know, 80 to 120 grams, depending on what it's coming from, um, my protein was, you know, six, seven ounces. So mm -hmm. pretty small. Um, and then if I was getting ready for a contest, those two would kind of just gradually change because, uh, you know, obviously the less carbohydrate you take, the more protein perhaps you need. And I found that to be true. Um, so I got up to eating. There was a certain time where I was eating 12 ounces of protein per meal five, six times a day. And actually, ironically, it correlated when it, with when I did best com competitively. Um, do I think I need that much? No. But it comes down to that. I and mean, this is the ultimate question, right? It's like, if I'm not taking it from protein, what am I taking it from? Mm. Um, so... And I would always believe that manipulating carbs worked for me. I didn't really believe in a low carb diet, but I manipulated. I believed in manipulating carbs. So some days I'd be, you know, six, seven hundred, eight hundred grams of carbs. Some days I'd be a hundred, two hundred grams, and some days I would be lower than that. But it would always be fluctuating based on my work capacity, um, my work volume. So were you over a gram per pound of body weight with protein, or was it always around? Yeah, I was always over a gram. Oh, it's like yeah, three fifty, four hundred. A gram would be kind of staple for me. A gram would be kind of baseline. Got it. Got it. Um, but again, in the off season, when my carbs were up at around 800,000 be grams, it'd be lower because it just wasn't necessary. Now, something you said that was awesome um, that I did not expect to come out of your mouth was that you have your trainers will tell the clients to have days where they go low protein. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah, once a week, man. Once a week, we recommend um, low or you know meatless Monday kind of thing where we don't mm. eat any meat. Now, um, we talk about cool. that on our that's show right? all yeah, the time. Explain why you do that. Just resensitization to protein. I think there's a tremendous benefit from mm -hmm. a gut health perspective oh, yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, dude, and we talked about this again when we were training, just the idea of getting uncomfortable and being mindful. Like if I remove a nutrient, I think that's one of the greatest benefits of all these diets that people are attaching to is like, if hey, what's the benefit of ketogenic dieting? Is it beneficial? Sure. From certain perspectives, certain people at certain times of the year and certain parts of their life. But the biggest fucking benefit is it's the being mindful of what's going in their yep. mouth. Most people just eat so mindlessly and just shove whatever they can into their hole. Like, mm. just, st just stop and think about it for a minute, and then that'll be step one in changing your body, right? Taking control of what's going on. Yeah, pay don't attention eat mindlessly. to the signs and signals. Yeah, don't eat mindlessly, man. And, yeah. dude, we're all guilty of it. Like, uh, I, you know, I'm just as guilty of, you know, the, the number of tubs of peanut butter that have disappeared over the last <laughs> couple of years. I'm like, fuck, where did that thing go, right? Yeah. Everybody does it, but, like, being mindful of it as often as you can. Mm. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the sport of bodybuilding. I know we're going to have a lot of fans that are like, I want to hear more about what they're doing, You know how bodybuilding has changed. I was a huge fan growing up, and I remember distinctly there being a dramatic switch all of a sudden, and it was when Dorian Yates won his first Olympia, and he showed up on stage and took bodybuilding. I mean, there were there's several phases of bodybuilding that I can remember. I mean, you had the 70s. Then the 80s, all of a sudden, they looked so much more shredded and more muscular. And then it was like that for a while. And then Dorian showed up and just was this new level of mass monster. Um, and now we're seeing some changes as well. What's happening to cause those dramatic shifts? Like, what did Dorian you was it, was it, you know, growth hormone, insulin? Like, what were they doing differently that changed their bodies? And what's happening now that's different? I mean, we talked about Kuwait last night and bodybuilders going over there. I mean, we can, go, we can run the gamut here, but... 
what's happening now that's really different uh, or changed, or is it just more of the same? Well, what happened with Dorian, I think, I think, you know, and, I, and I don't want to take anything away from anybody that came before him, but I think maybe for the first time he was the guy who was all consumed, right? It was just the only thing he did. He didn't leave his house. He didn't leave his gym. And that shifted the paradigm altogether, right? Mm-hmm. Like previous to that, you know, Arnold was at the beach a couple of times a day. He was probably experimenting with mind expanding things. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, he's the seventies, right? Yeah. So he's doing what he's doing. Uh, and then you go start getting the eighties. Lee Haney was just fucking amazing and blessed, worked hard, but still very, very blessed and probably didn't have to live a completely consumed life. And then you push into Dorian who lived this consumed life and he brought this package that nobody ever seen. So it changed the paradigm of of the entire industry. It's the you know, same idea with Roger Roger Bannister in the four minute mile, right? Is, I was just gonna yeah. relate this topic to if you're a fan of sports, it's yeah. pretty common across the board on all sports. If you compared a basketball player and a football player today Massive. to thirty years ago, right. yep. you would think that they're doing all these other anabolics and crazy stuff. But really, the dedication level is starting at an earlier age. The uh, some anotypes we're yeah. learning more what body types are better for what sports. Sure. The sport has evolved, right? And, and, and Without a shadow of a doubt, the the chemistry changed in the '90s. Um, you know, there's a lot more designer drugs, um, and those guys will be transparent about that, I'm sure. Um, so that changed it all, and I think that's what was responsible for the hard, like shredded look. Oh, the '90s with those guys came to stage is grainy. Everybody and was fucking crazy looking. Yeah, man. And I don't want to throw I don't want to throw names out, but people would tell me like guys guys would walk in like guys from Balco and all those you know chemistry companies would walk into Gold's Gym and look at guys and go, oh, you need a little bit of this and a little bit of that. We're going to make you this drug, and like it, the next day it'd kind of show up at their wow. place. Wow. Yeah, interesting perspective, but you know, obviously that doesn't exist anymore. So mm-hmm. that's changed the the paradigm of the sport. But I think that. Dorian just changed the paradigm, changed mm. changed people's belief as to what it could look like. What, what was possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. And, and like what and what it took. Like he was pretty transparent about like I don't fucking talk to anybody. I don't make appearances. I just all I do is train because I'm going to be the best. It's like Michael Jordan basketball. When Michael Jordan hit there, everyone said, "Oh shit, we could actually well, take off from the free throw line. We could do things like this." Changed if, everything. If you man. put well, the work, I'll in. tell you what disenfranchised me as as a, as a young kid that was such a um, a fan of the sport. I knew they used drugs. I knew all that stuff happened. It wasn't a big deal to me. They still had to work hard, fine, do whatever. It's when I learned about synthol and the injectable oils that didn't sure. even build muscle. That's when I totally like disconnected and, from the sport. Man, I, I don't know, man, but I don't think that I, – I, I really believe that's more prominent with the kids who want to look like the bodybuilders than it is with the bodybuilders. And don't get me wrong. I could be wrong, man, but – you can kind of tell when a guy's fucking full of synthol. And when you look up close, these, most of these bodybuilders, maybe some of them are doing it. I'm sure there's a few that stick out in my mind that have done it. But like, I remember the 90s, there were a few bodybuilders that, no, yeah, at the yeah, time, yeah, before sure. anybody knew about synthol, right. there was that guy Manfred, whatever, and Ernie right. Taylor. And you're Ernie like, Taylor's one that comes to mind. Yeah, and you're like, wow, look at those arms. They look fucking insane. How are they so big? And then, of course, later on, you look about, learn about synthol. And like, he was one of the first motherfuckers experiment. It wasn't with even shit. synthol back then. It was something completely different. Escaline. Yeah, Escaline, yeah. Escaline, is that yeah. how you say it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you say it. Semantics, right? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that, um, and. Yeah, that was a big deal back wow. then because it expanded the muscle without blurring it, and that was very different. Now synthol is oil, which is different. Like you see these monkeys on Instagram, and you see like, oh. dude, that, you, <laughs> you look like it hurts, right? It looks like painful. I'm like, oh, oh, man, what yeah. are you doing, man? Well, the muscle doesn't change from flex to relax. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. Or they look like it's they have bizarre. implants. There's one dude that does it, does it all in his pecs, and it looks like he's got oh, implants. Man, what's going through their head, right? <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I, oh, I, and man. I wonder if it's like ster- steroids with women, right? So steroids with women, I'm completely against, obviously. And... Uh, the thing is with them, it's one of those things like once they do it, I don't think they realize how much it's going to change them and all of a sudden they've gone too far and they're right. fucked and, and they yep. can't go back. Yep. And I wonder if it's like that with those synthol guys because you obviously don't know what's going through the head, but you wonder if like, hey man, once they've done it, they're like, oh shit, I've so far gone now, I might as well just keep going. And they don't know what yeah. the long-term yeah, effects are. I mean, steroids with on. women, I mean, I've seen pictures of, I mean, people, don't, women don't realize it's like, if, like clitoral enlargement. Like if yeah. you, you go online and look at some of these bodybuilders and they ha- it looks like they have little penises. Yeah. That doesn't shrink. And dude, and, and the thing that people don't point out is the psychological change. Is that you're literally becoming a man. You, you're changing the androgen profiles in your brain. You're just not the same human being anymore. And I couldn't imagine how much that fucks with a woman's psychology to realize like, hey, I didn't really want this, but this is one of the results. Like I wanted to get this awesome body and nobody told me that I'm going to t- put this needle in my ass. And all, or these pills or whatever the fuck I'm taking and then all of a sudden I'm going to change the human being that I am I'm going to change the way my brain works and I'm going to become a different person that's a fucked up perspective what do you see happen with women when they start to go on cycle psychologically uh, they're just angry man women, women aren't meant to be um, they're meant to be emotional beings right and, and you amplify an emotion of a woman and 
She, oh wow! Yeah, yeah. You're amplifying the, her anger. You're amplifying her uh, insecurities, her anxiety. I mean, the time you amplify somebody's anger, you're amplifying anxiety, right? Um, it's just a whole. And then all these women end up on antidepressants and, and antipsychotics, and then there's a whole bunch of negative shit that goes on to women because mm-hmm. they're not meant to have testosterone. You introduce it to the system, they're meant to have a little bit, but it's a very interesting paradigm, man. That I try to dissuade any women listening out there. Like, you don't realize once. Uh, so here's a perfect story, man. I, I knew this girl. 15 years ago now, um, who was this beautiful girl working at a tanning salon. And she goes, hey, you know, like, I want to do this. And I go, why? And she goes, oh, you know, I want to compete. I go, well, you don't have to do that to compete. So she did one shot of Winstrol, and her voice changed. It never went back. One shot. Wow. Wow. It was like from difference from Friday to Monday. Wow. And her voice never went back. And I was like, was that fucking worth it? Like, I don't know, man. To me, like. I was just going to ask you what you thought about, because it's. God, it's crazy how many bikini girls are, are doing a- Winstrol and Clombuterol, and I'm right. like, you're a bikini girl. Because right. well, the unfortunate part is they think it's part of the sport, right? They think it's part of the reality. Maybe it's for some of them it is, but the, the truly gifted ones don't have to do it. And, and if you're not one of the truly gifted ones, do it for the love of the sport rather than for the desire to be Miss Olympia or whatever it is like. If you're not doing it for the love of the sport, you're doing it for the vanity, you're in it for the wrong reason. It's not going to change. Like, people think that becoming this amazing, you know, Instagram person is going to change their confidence or change the person that they are. But it doesn't, man. It's just going to make it more well, amplified. So, right? first, first off, to each their own, you know, if you want to do something your body, yeah, go yeah, for it. Man. But I will say this, like, a lot of women don't realize, if, you, if you're a woman and you go to the doctor and you say, I would like to change my gender. Mm -hmm. I would like to now legally become a man. The first thing they do is put you on anabolic steroids. Mm -hmm. So you're literally doing that to yourself and you are changing. This is why the clitoris grows. It's the part of the the female anatomy that's homogenous to the penis. And your voice drops and you grow facial hair and you literally become a man. Whereas when a man takes testosterone, he's not changing his gender. He's just getting more testosterone mm-hmm. and he's not going to have such a drastic change in psychology sure. he may get hornier he may get you know all that right. kind of and, stuff and all those things are already present in his brain and your body is evolutionarily adapted to that so you know when people talk about guys going on steroid rages and shit it's all fucking bullshit it's mm-hmm. all just amplified versions of who they already are mm-hmm. you, you know it's you know it's actually connected to um men losing their tempers estrogen and estrogen, estrogen and low estrogen. testosterone yeah higher estrogen <laughs> Yeah, low yeah. testosterone will do that. I, I Most hear guys you, rage when they come off their cycle. Right, right. Like, yeah. I want to hear what you think about this. I, I shared this on a podcast maybe about a month or two ago, and I know I got a lot of feedback. I got some, of obviously, hate, but then I, I got a lot of people that changed their mind about competing after what I said. And one of the things that I had said is, you know, I'm, I feel like, and I feel like Instagram and social media is, is part of the, the reason is it's become like trendy that everybody wants to become a bikini or a men's physique or bodybuilder or whatever. Like it's become very trendy yeah. to do. Yeah. And I said, you know, a lot of people don't know that I spent a solid year to, mind you, I've been training for 15 plus years already. Then I spent a solid year to two, year and a half or so, almost two years of training to get ready to just step on the amateur stage. Mm-hmm. And I tell people that if you've never dieted down and leaned down and got yourself in the best shape of your life naturally by yourself and figured that out, I don't really think you have any business getting on and competing at the highest level against the one percenters in the world. It's like you going out and playing a sport that you've never really played before and trying to play sure. with the best. Right. It's like me showing up and running against the same bolt. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's a little ridiculous, but it is what it is. Um, I try to dissuade people for a different reason, man. I think it just changes your perception. One, if you're, if you're doing it for Instagram, um, Instagram is just a dopamine hit, right? Every time you get somebody hits a like, you get oh, this man. amazing, yeah. feel I feel good about myself. Yeah. And people think that the more likes they get, the better they're going to feel about themselves, which we all know is fucking bullshit. Um, but in reality, the reason I try to dissuade people from competing is it, it changes the way you perceive food, particularly for women. Men can t- usually detach from it, but some men can't. But particularly for women, food becomes a reward system. So they reward themselves with cheating, um, you know, big cheat days. Like, I've done really well. Uh, like, let's go, oh, let's go yeah. there. Let's go uh, there. I don't know if we need to go there. But oh, just, just the idea that, man, if, if you're an emotional eater to begin with or if you think you're trying to do a show because it's going to get you in great shape and you're going to maintain it, it's not a good idea. You just have to make a lifestyle change. You have to make a shift that goes, hey, for the rest of my life, this is who I am. This is the person I've become. Rather than, hey, I'm going to do this one show in 12 weeks and then I'm going to become... Like, I've seen a woman, uh, and no exaggeration, I know her very well, put on 60 pounds in uh, under a month, four weeks after yep. the contest. When she did a show, she looked fucking unbelievable. And then four weeks later, uh, completely different human being, 
unrecognizable and could never go back. Mm. She just destroyed her metabolism. Just, you know, obviously, training will shut down your thyroid to some extent. And then eating all these calories again just destroyed her hormonal profile. Hormonal profile. No progesterone anymore, no estrogen anymore. Like All these things are just destroyed and never get it back. Mm. I'm gonna make I'm gonna make you go there, dude, because I I a lot of uh, the stuff I used to speak out on when I was going through competing was the because I didn't know about it until I got in it right. and I found this this cheat meal cheat day right. cheat thing and I just couldn't connect with it because I I didn't understand why you would want to create that relationship with food of mm. I eat really good then I reward myself with all this bad shit right, right? and and yeah. calling it a day and, and, and it's not only that man if it's people that rationalize it as like this is good for me I'm doing something good for myself you know we have, yeah anyways it's the idea that it's been perpetuated by a few coaches um, saying you know cheat days are good for you and there's absolutely no reason why physiologically cheat day would be beneficial for you there's absolutely a benefit as to why uh, a calorie a increase, surplus would be calorie good. increase would be good for you but you don't have to get that beating fucking pop tarts no right. I'd say probably the worst uh, connections to food or eating disorders and self image issues I've seen are people in the in the competing it's world terrible and um, I mean if, if you don't believe me go go see any bodybuilder or bikini or physique competitor post contest and watch what they do with food i know people who will buy boxes of you know you know oreo cookies and ice cream and whatever and and literally have it in their fridge in their cupboard and re, and be like i can't wait to eat this this Dude, is what i'm gonna have so the trophy case. i dated this girl years and years ago who used to eat entire baskin robbins ice cream cakes the big ones so one day she had one next day she had another one and she fucking flipped on her roommate for taking a piece of her Baskin Robbins ice cream cake. And I'm like, and, and this is on top of her stopping at you know donut places and all this other junk mm-hmm. on the way home. And I'm like, she got to the point where she ate, she ate so much crap, she stunk, like she had like bo coming out of her system. And it's, oh, it's just oh, like ridiculous. It's awesomely attractive, right? Yeah. It's reality, man. Girls get such a, this attachment with I've been I've been depriving myself for so long. I can make up for it. And but where does it stop? There's, yeah. Unless there's a line in the sand, man, it just keeps going and going and going until finally your brain goes, oh, damn it, I look like shit. I have to change this. And by that point, you're usually too far gone. Right? And well, the, sad, the sad thing about um, and the difficult thing about competing on a stage is if you're not in a, in a secure situation with yourself, sure. that's probably the last thing you should do. And the unfortunate thing is it tends to attract people who are not. That's what I was going to say. Those are the people that are drawn to the sport because they think it's going to change who they are. It's going to make me yeah. really confident in myself. And it right. won't, unfortunately. Like it, it, just, it just can't. A game changer for me with food because I had horrible self uh, body image issues. Um, this is why I got into resistance training and you know why I even abused my body uh, in my younger years. And a game changer for me was fasting. I remember I used to have to eat every two hours because I'm like, oh, shit, I'm going to lose muscle if I don't eat all the time. And I had food with me all the time and protein shakes with me and bars. And the first time I actually broke free of that and did a fast and didn't lose all this muscle. And I remember it was like this enlightening moment like, yeah. holy shit, like I can go out with my family and not have to take three Tupperware containers full of chicken and rice and bars and protein shakes with me everywhere. Yep. And it was just this mind-blowing experience. And when people ask me advice on nutrition and, and competitors in particular, one of the best things I can t- tell them is try intermittent fasting. Break free from the chains of the, I need to eat every, you know, every other hour right. and, and see what well, happens. I was the first coach in the bikini and men's physique world that I knew that was actually prescribing that to his athletes. And I, was just, and I did it just to fuck with everybody, just to be like, yes, we can get ready for this show and absolutely we can intermittent fast and it'll be great for you. Right. And just threw a curveball on everybody and everybody was tripping out that I was doing that, but I was blown away that... Here we are. We're getting ready to lean down, anyways. So we're we're in cutting for a show. Why wouldn't we throw a great day of intermittent fasting in there every once in a while? You talked about it earlier. Do you incorporate that right now into your routine? I do. Yep. Um, probably once a month, I'll do like a forty-eight hour fast. Nice. Right. Um, what do you notice from it when you do it uh, for you? I have tremendous mental clarity. Yeah. Um, I actually notice as soon as I reintroduce food, my energy levels dip. My mental clarity dips. Mm. Um, honestly, man, if I could just not eat, life would be fucking awesome. <laughs> like you have no attachment yeah. to anything. So, yeah. like I said, I'm, I'm heading on a vacation today, and I'm, my plan for the week is to kind of like not eat. 
Like I might eat a couple times, but I want to eat some veggies and like I don't I don't even know what I'm gonna do. But I have no attachment. Like it's the first time in my life I can take a vacation. This is a cool thing, right? I should probably mm. document this. But first time in my life I can take a vacation and have no attachment to having to eat, having to train. Wow, that's have, a paradigm shift right dude, there. This is the first one, really. First one ever, man. Oh shit! Wow. Yep. wow. You're gonna yep. be. You're gonna find. I don't know. You may find that. I Liberating. Found this, I found this myself the first time I did that because vacations for me used to be, and I was never a competitive bodybuilder. I was just obsessed. Vacations to me were like, does the hotel have a gym? Yeah. Where can I get my food? What do I need to bring? Oh, we're going to go see this thing. Okay, I got to make sure I have this food. And then all of a sudden, I can go on vacation and just be like, fuck, I could just be with my family? Yeah. It was mind-blowing to me. And vacations became so enjoyable. I'll be interested to see what your experience is with that. Yeah, man. I have no attachment to anything. Like, it's the first time where I'm packing shit. And I'm like, why don't I have to bring six different changes of outfits for the day to like get in my two workouts and my cardio? You know, I'm like, I'm just going to go and kind of exist so yeah it's a new did you catch yourself reaching to those habits though or did you uh, or did you no, know man, I think going you went in pre- with yeah it. pretty mindful of the fact that I'm going out in the woods with my kids and it's going to be like a, no workouts I mean I will swim we'll meditate my kids are starting to get into meditation and yoga which is a cool thing <laughs> but, yeah I'm not pushing them into it they're actually asking like daddy can I get up with you at 430 to meditation I was like no you can't but you know, we'll teach you when you wake up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's daddy time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, you know, also don't want your kid up at 4.30, but yeah, but it's definitely daddy time. Yeah. yeah. But it'd be cool, man. Just, yeah, disconnecting and, and see what happens and have no emotional attachment to what I look like when I come back. Mm-hmm. And if, you know, if I look like I've, I haven't been in gym in a week, hey, you haven't been in gym in a week, that's okay, right? <laughs> right. And you're not, you're not going to take away from your paycheck and you're not going to, Nothing's going to happen. The world's not going to end. I love the fact that you can talk about all these different things that are so outside of that scope of you know, muscle building hypertrophy. We talked right. about gut health mm-hmm. even last night. You're one of the only bodybuilders that I've heard ever talk about the microbiome mm-hmm. and taking care of the microbiome. We have, I guarantee we have some bodybuilders listening right now or some aspiring bodybuilders, and they've heard all the usual advice. What advice can you give them that's different, that maybe encompasses some of that, that may help them? Fasting is a good one. That's a good start. Um, and it's not, and, and, and like you spoke about, man, it's, it's not going to kill your gains. It actually may accelerate them. And I spoke of that. I do that with. Um, now explain sure. that. Why? Because uh, I've heard people are like, no way, fasting is not going to help with gains. I've experienced yeah. it. In, yeah. I've experienced that myself. Just kind of a resensitization to mm-hmm. um, to protein synthesis to the mTOR pathway, right? So, um, when you're constantly stimulating mTOR, your body it almost becomes like the mute signal, right? It's it's the idea of that perpetual noise your body stops hearing. So, I'm um, taking a break from it. Same idea with like not eating for t- eight to ten hours at night when you sleep. Like some people, are like oh, I got to wake up and have a shake in the middle of the night. No, you don't. You have to. <laughs> you, have, you should fast. Uh, same idea, but in having that day, you know, I wouldn't suggest two days for most people, but 24 hour fast or, or even like a warrior, know, 16 or 18 hours. Sure, yeah. Like don't eat in the morning, eat before you go to bed kind of thing, yeah, no. or, or maybe eat in the morning and don't eat before, like one of whatever. Uh, and just disconnecting from the idea of, of having to eat every couple hours. I think that would have a huge benefit and, and have been shown to shift the microbiome. Uh, the biggest thing, man, I think if, if anyone's out there, start to starting to acknowledge the fact that you are not what you eat, you're what you absorb. And if you can supplement your microbiome with a diverse array of, um, you know, mitochondrial or, or microbiome accessible carbohydrates, so um, like in, prebiotics, in, in, no insoluble fibers. Mm. So you know, all those fibers are are fueled off insoluble fibers. And if you can take in a vast array of different types of fibers, you're going to be fueling these different micro these uh, different. Um, Bacteria. Yeah, we talked to Dr. Ruscio about that. Chicory yeah. root, I think, is a good one, and certain per- types of starches. Sure. And he did talk about, and I want to make sure I say this on, on the show, that there are some people where they may benefit from sometimes trimming back their microbiome load. And you'll know you're this kind of person if you find that you eat a prebiotic like you're talking about, and you'll get a horrible gut reaction. I was one of these people for a while. Something that reset me was a 48 or 72 hour fast. Mm. It brought everything back down. Then I could eat those things, uh, and then my body responded. It could be an inflammatory thing, right? So your microbiome is directly correlated with inflammation. So you could just be bringing down the inflammatory mark. Exactly. Uh, the other thing that's very fascinating is, you know, uh, Dr. Walter Longo um, talks a lot about fasting. He's doing some of the most amazing research on it, and he does a, what's called a fasting mimicking diet. But when you're fasting, all of your old cells, if you will, are what uh, start to die off. It's your, um, you know, increase uh, apoptosis and uh, stem cells start to get stimulated. When you eat again, 
uh, you build up these cells again and they're newer and healthier. And uh, I know that studies have shown that 72 hour fast will recycle your white blood cells, almost all of them in animals, which is hmm. pretty fascinating stuff. Organs will shrink. You'll actually lose size of your liver when sure. you fast maybe, and then maybe, it rebuilds. Yeah, maybe by some, so liver's got a lot of protein in it, right? So yeah. maybe it's just catabolizing the amino acid. Yeah, it's process. it's really, really fascinating stuff and this process uh, really does benefit the muscle building process. I've I've been doing a low protein day now for a couple years and on the low protein day, I can feel it, but the day after when I eat that protein, it's, it's like you blow up. Turbocharge. Yeah. Yes. It's like turbocharge, and this is all important stuff. Even if your goal is muscle building, it's important to stress think, those things. I, yeah, I think the hard thing that I had with that as, as a body, well, I, I think I would have been okay with doing it. It's just picking the day to do it. Like <laughs> Today's legs, fuck. Uh, tomorrow, yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's like, man, I'm, I got to have like three days in a row off, right? Because if you're going to... If you're going to train today, you better not fast. Or, I mean, I would suggest you don't fast if you're having any type of high-intensity training. And if you're going to train tomorrow, you don't want to train, you don't want to fast today. So mm-hmm. it's like one of those, like most guys don't take more than two days off in a row. And maybe start there. Maybe mm-hmm. it's like taking two days off training in a row. Like, oh, hey, that's a big paradigm shift for some guys too. Like, I got to train seven days a week because there's morons out there perpetuating that, which is that was ridiculous. A, that was a big paradigm yes. shift for me was being the young skinny kid who was trying to build sure. muscle. I put it in like, oh, the, the more I'm in here hammering the it, the more I'm yeah, going to grow. The gym, the better. But I was burning so much and sure. not allowing myself to recover that. And, just taking days off, I So that just kind of points my brain in the direction of speaking to one thing we talked about on the gym floor was Arthur Jones. Uh, and we said, you know, Arthur Jones had something's right and something's wrong. And speaking to that, I think the biggest um, reason why a lot of people don't build, or not the biggest, but one of the reasons that people don't build their bodies is it's this constant low grade, low grade stimulus. So when they're training, they're training seven days a week. So how intense are they training? Mm, how, how hard are their workouts? Probably not that hard. Whereas if you trained a little less often, trained a little harder, you probably have a higher level stimulus and you actually get a response from it. And I think that is the first step for people. Like if you're training seven days a week, step outside the gym for three days and go back and tell me how you felt that day. Mm-hmm. And if that's still the same intensity you were generating when you would do seven days in a row, then keep doing seven days in a row. But you need to be able to take three days off and maintain that level of intensity. Like, you know, how, how do you guys feel after you take three days off? I know I go back in. I feel like a fucking superhero. Oh, yeah. Like I can, my, my weights go up 20%. Everything's awesome. My strength is awesome. Kind of how I feel every time I get in the gym now because I'm only training three days a week. It, so I'm replenished. My intensity's there. My focus is there. It's almost like, you know, you're, you have like a caged beast and you're holding me back and they'll say, you let me go. And like, boom, your intensity's through the roof. Your, your focus through the roof. It's funny how many times I had to feel that, though, before it got tattooed sure, in my fucking right, head. You know, yeah. it's like every time I go back, God damn, every time I give myself rest, I feel great. You know, but still getting out. Out of that at breaking that habit right and, and you know what it's it's probably the nature of of the beast the nature of the alpha male or female to want to do more and more and more and i was guilty of it uh, just as much if not more than anybody like you know if if i'm getting in there and i'm crushing it today i'm gonna get in there i'm gonna crush it tomorrow when when do you stop like you know for me i, I always was of the mentality i'm gonna work harder than everybody so i i absolutely overtrained i absolutely trained too much and it's it's hard when you're in it to go oh i need a couple of days off you know, that's where having an intelligent coach comes in. Um, like, hey, man, like push as hard as you can for a short period of time, overreach, mm-hmm. and then chill out or take three days off. What helps me, what helped me a lot with that was also deter- de- deciphering the difference between a day off and doing nothing sure. or a day off and having active recovery. Sure, yeah. That changed everything for me yeah. because I was under the impression as a kid that – Today's my day off. I should sit here and do nothing and let my body like build lay muscle. In bed. Yeah. When in, when when you do that, you actually send a, a signal to atrophy. I mean, you could have the you could train your legs like crazy on Monday and then go to bed and don't move for four days. You're going to come back not stronger. Sure, you'll lose muscle. And so when I learned that active recovery was actually more effective for me, stretching, mobility, even going into the gym and just l- moving through full range of motion, yep. stretching and squeezing. Boy, did that amplify the muscle building signal that I had sent the day before. And we've branded that in our programs. We call them trigger sessions and MAPS anabolic or focus sessions and MAPS aesthetic. But it it makes a huge difference to understand that. Um, What about frequency of training? I know bodybuilding or bodybuilders now for a long time have been preaching once a week. Hammer your muscle once a week. Rest it until the next week. Sure. Uh, what is your belief on that? Do you believe in more frequency, maybe another day a week with less intensity? I know studies right now are showing, there's a few now that have come out Repeat that have that. shown, yeah, that if you get like, instead of doing, you know, uh, 15 sets one day, you're better off doing five sets three days a week or something like that. Have you looked at the populations? No. 
Oh well, one of them was uh, one of them was athletes, but uh, the other one I believe was it's usually sedentary. Sedentary. Yeah, which is normal. Mm. Um, so my thought on that is, it depends. <laughs> you know, as always, of course, depends. of course. Yeah. Um, so if someone is a lower level trainee, meaning they haven't been training for a long time or their execution isn't great. Um, it's a learning curve. It's a learning process. So the amount of stimulus that's actually going into their muscles when they're training is very low. So it needs to be more frequent for, for to optimize the learning curve and optimize just getting more stimulus into that muscle. Mm -hmm. So someone who hasn't who isn't really a highly trained athlete would absolutely benefit from higher frequency. But someone the more advanced you get, I really believe the frequency goes down. Um, you know, so you know, someone like myself, if I were to train a muscle more than every five days, provided that I'm having a tremendous amount of stimulus that in that in that workout, which I usually am, um, I think it's probably too much. And then, can that change? Of course, based on your um, your cellular uh, nu nutrient levels. So, like, am I nourished or am I depleted? Where am I in my cycle as far as like um, you know, am I dieting for a contest? Am I in, in caloric excess in the off season? Um, so, all those things are variables, man. So, but I think that the the simplest way to, to express it to people is. If you're new or if you're a beginner, if you're learning something new, it's a learning curve. If you do it once a week, what's the learning curve like? We talked about this when yeah. training. It's, it's terrible. So if I want to optimize learning curve, I need to go often, two to three times a week, sometimes four times a week for some people. Um, and then so you're training with less volume, obviously. So volume and frequency are inversely proportional. So if I'm training with high frequency, I need low volume. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for someone, the more advanced you get, then you start kind of spreading out your frequency and, and, and eventually going into... Um, you know, maybe one session every four to five days. I think that's optimal. But then again, that, that cycles back and forth in both directions. Mm -hmm. So if there's a period where I know my recoverability is low or my calories are low, I can't sustain the recovery from a high level of volume. So I need to then shift back to higher frequency. Mm -hmm. So uh, it kind of shifts back and forth, man. And, and uh, you know, maybe related to just honestly the amount of muscle mass that you carry. I mean, when you're, you know, 300 pound bodybuilder and you're doing squats, and I'm a 180 pound dude doing squats, um, and we're going at very, very high intensity. Um, there's a lot of more shit happening with that much more weight and muscle. Yeah, neurologically as well. Yeah. So there's a lot of considerations. But I think you know this is where periodization and, and programming comes in. Is just you, you got to you know you're waking up, you're working up to this peak environment of creating as much volume as you can every five days. But how long can you sustain that? How long do you want to sustain that as being a novel stimulus? And then once that novel stimulus loses its novelty, change it. Well, then change it, and then yeah. then you know decrease the amount of volume a little bit, increase the frequency a little bit, and kind of just go back and forth from yeah. from those. Two. One, th I mean, uh, and people re you know uh, need to realize that the human body has an incredible ability to adapt. Sure. Like you can adapt yeah. to a lot of frequency as well. I know mm -hmm. Olympic lifters will squat every day twice a day twice a day yep. and have trim i mean and they're recovering fine from that and they're squatting tremendous amounts of weight yep. um, but it's not a muscular stimulus right no it's, they're, it's they're training stimulus. a movement yeah yep. they're training their cns mm -hmm. um and which is also important if you're looking for of course overall right function performance you mm -hmm. want to be able to work with both those sure. i think that's kind of what you're well how, how do you feel about that feeding into hypertrophy even if hypertrophy is your main goal how important do you feel training the central nervous system and training adaptations like that, like a power lifter occasionally? Like, do you ever flirt with that as a bodybuilder? I think there's a benefit in strength training, but I wouldn't, if my exclusive goal is, is body transformation, muscle building, and hypertrophy, I don't think there's, an, I no longer think there's a need to, to um, diverge from perfect execution, if, if I can put that in quotations. So, you know, people go, well, should I do cheat reps and forced reps? And when should I lose my form and get have shitty form? The answer is never um, because you're just instilling bad habits. Sure. Um, so if your exclusive goal is hypertrophy, you want to be a bodybuilder, you want to learn how to train, uh, maximum hypertrophy, you know, maximum body transformation, there's absolutely a place for strength training, which is just shifting the percentage of loads. But there's not a place for strength training being correlated with shitty form. Mm. So no. what, do you, what do you think about, I feel that this was something else I talked about a few years ago. Uh, the chasing of PRs. Like, I didn't even know the term PR 10 years ago. I've sure. never even heard that. And I feel uh, CrossFit has really mm -hmm. uh, brought this to the, the masses. And now I see all over sure. PR this, PR that, PR this. <laughs> and uh, so many people chasing that. Yeah. Um, what do you feel? How do you feel about that? Man, I, I get a lot of slack in, uh, you know, on social media for being the guy that says progressive overload is bullshit. Which you know is like the holy grail of, of muscle building for most people, and and I say that in this very specific context. So, most people 
put um, progressive overload in the context of more weight on the bar mm-hmm. means more muscle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but you got to realize there's more to progressive overload. With re- so if we're talking about strength training, more weight on the bar is, is your holy grail. Uh, if we're tra- talking about hypertrophy, there is a, absolutely a benefit to quote-unquote progressive overload. But progressive overload for hypertrophy does not equate to weight on the bar. Um, there's more variables to increasing... Like time under tension. Yeah. Uh, load. And so there, there's... Lo- hey, listen, so there's more components to force than just load. There's, like you speak about time, there's also distance that people don't think about. Mm-hmm. So if I'm doing... Here's an example, man. This is the analogy I give in my classes all the time. If I'm doing a 100-pound dumbbell press, let's say I'm doing a flat uh, bench press dumbbell press, and I'm doing... Uh, 100 pounds and I'm doing 10 reps and when I'm doing it my hands are directly over are directly over my elbows so I'm doing a press and then through the entire rep my hands stay directly over my elbows I do 100 pounds for clean rep 100 pounds 10 clean reps uh, and then I go well that was easy I want to go up so I do go to 110 but now all of a sudden my hands dump two inches inside my elbows what have I just done well, now you, you've I've shortened de- the lever yeah. I've decreased the distance from the axis I've decreased the distance from the shoulder joint which is the you know the joint I'm trying to influence so I've decreased it by potentially up 20% so I've actually decreased the load that's influencing that joint by up to 20% so people go oh man I just did 110s today I'm like who fucking cares like what did it look like did it look the same as the 100s or did it look worse so the progression may be as simple as hey I'm doing 100 pound dumbbells for 10 reps well guys if you're out there try changing this try taking your hands from being directly over your, your elbows to taking them one inch outside your elbows so you just increase the distance from the axis a little bit so you increase the length of the lever a little bit and now i'm doing 10 20 percent more work during that set and that's the first progression right and then once you can own that we talk a lot about ownership in this business like i want to own every inch of that contractile range once you do that then maybe we can go up to 110s with my hands directly over my elbows to the entire you know see what i'm saying absolutely so most mm-hmm. guys you know, see every guy do, do like the 140s and their hands are basically directly over the shoulders will end up being like a close grip bench press which is effectively doing nothing for their pec even though they think they're doing a bench press mm. you're training your triceps man you're training your front delts you're not really doing much for your pec because there's no distance from the axis so so the analogy is if i were to hold the dumbbell directly over my head like this i'm showing you guys here and we can see this on a podcast but if i'm holding a dumbbell directly over my head like where my wrist elbow and shoulders are stacked how hard is it it's real easy i could stand there all day and that's the same idea whereas if i now if i put it out all the way lengthen out to my side like an iron cross that's heavy as shit out there right and nothing's changed it's still the same way it's just changing the distance from the axis so if i'm doing a dumbbell press and i'm bringing it right over my shoulder joint what is that doing to my pec nothing but it's doing a lot to my tricep potentially but what muscle are you trying to influence right Mm -hmm. these are things that uh, people don't consider and why i say progressive overload is quote-unquote bullshit i just say it to you know ruffles people's feathers a little bit but just make them think like there's more to it than load. So if I just because I say, hey man, I, I did the 120s today, who fucking cares? Right. Like, How did what, you do them? Yeah, did it look yeah. the same? Did it, was it better? You know, it's uh, that's why execution has to be the standard because it's the only way to objective objectively assess progress. Yeah, we talk about that all the time with quality. Like, yeah. yeah, quality of your reps. Like rather right. than adding weight to the bar on your squat, get your squat better, get better control, and, and get, defining what that objectively means. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So we're really clear on um, when we teach this stuff. Is like, what's the objective? Am I trying to turn my quads or am I trying to turn my glutes? Or am I trying to do a powerlifting squat? Which one is my objective? And right. learning how to manipulate the exercise to, to influence either one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so if I'm doing a quad-based squat, it's fucking completely different than I'm doing a glute-based squat and completely different than if I'm doing a power-based squat. They're all just completely different. But you know, when, when guys write programs, well, I do a squat. What the fuck does that mean? Like, It's a completely different thought process, man. It's a completely different execution. And we can go through videos, all that stuff, if you guys want to do it for your followers, man. It'd be, it'd be cool to actually dive into that. But Yeah, when you come visit absolutely. us, we've got to do sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah cool place. series, yeah. Dude, it's the simplest thing to see visually, but people are like, oh, I never thought about that before, you know? Mm. And, like, it's a fucking completely different exercise. And Well, you know, well there's, a, there's so many ways to make the muscle do more work. Sure. And the last way that you should uh, go to is adding weight slow, to yeah. the bar. yeah. yeah. Because that also happens to be the most risk for right. injury. And the heavier you go, the more likely your body is to revert to uh, you know, muscle recruitment patterns that are your defaults. And many times, exactly. those default recruitment patterns are the ones you don't necessarily want. Well, they're your strongest muscles. Right. So you, you know, your body's always going to revert back to its strengths. So Hardware. if you're trying to develop your, your weaknesses, then you should probably not allow those force reps to enter the equation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Great shit, point. man. Yeah. Great conversation, yeah, brother. Man. Great time, dude. Great time. Great Go time. on and on, huh? Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. No, we'll uh, we'll definitely do this again for sure, man. Definitely have you to, into our place, and uh, hopefully we'll have you down over at uh, Tahoe, man. 
Yeah. I'm going to have those dates sent over to you. Be there, yeah, I'd love, love to, to have you there. there. Yeah, yeah so. it's been a pleasure having you on, brother. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank Absolutely. you, man. Pleasure. Uh, check this out. Go to YouTube and check out Mind Pump TV. We post a new video every single day. You can also check us out on Instagram at Mind Pump Media. You can find my page at Mind Pump Sal. Adam's at Mind Pump Adam. And Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>